YouTube. We're doing a box right now. This is something new and exciting for us, but it's been out for a little bit from FMS. Oh my goodness, it's a T28 800 millimeter. This is a V2. So it's new for us because it does come with the reflex now, which is pretty exciting. And we have not done the 800 millimeter T28, but I love T28s. And we're gonna show you guys in this video exactly how it unboxes and we're gonna set it up with the NX8 and we're gonna set it up with an AR620 because the reflex is gonna take care of the stabilizer and auto leveling needs that you may have. Should work out pretty good. Let's look at the specs real quick. Uh, 800 millimeters as we mentioned earlier and uh, it looks like this thing, goodness gracious, only 470, only 470 grams flying weight, that's crazy. So it's a 3015, uh, 1750 kV motor with a 20 amp BSC. There's only four nine gram servos and it basically runs on a 1300 2S, not 3S. So that's unexpected, I didn't know that. So we're gonna open this thing up right now and see what it looks like. So here we go. It does have a seven inch by six three bladed prop. So that's uh, gonna be a different size than we've seen in the past, but it's cool that it's three bladed and painted, which is really neat. All right, guys, so this is not, uh, it's a small package, but it definitely does require some assembly like we've seen on typical plug-in flies from FMS. We've done a lot of FMSs lately and we've had super good luck with them. They've been great planes so far. I don't think we've really been let down by any of them. And let's go ahead and cut this thing. Well packaged, foam to protect the foam from the foam. Right, let's see what we got under here. Ooh, nice. We got the wing here, real simple, feels extremely light, which is nice. A Little bit of dihedral, a little bit of flex, not much twist, that's good. Looks like we have a servo here, quick detach for the landing gear. So you can take the landing gear if you want, you can take them off if you want, or you can leave them in. Kind of a weird way to pop those off, you see that? I think it's gonna make more sense when the actual landing gear is in there. But that just drops in there and it feels like it's broke, but it's not, it just clicks in. So we have digital nine gram servos, but it looks like they are plastic gear, I can't see. It's kind of hard to tell on that, but it says FMS nine gram digital plastic. So they're digital, which I don't really know if that matters, uh, but they are nine gram servers. So we have two of those, one for each aileron and they are outboard. So there is definitely panel lines here. If you decided you wanted to add flaps, you could hypothetically do it. And we have some plastic here to receive the screws that are gonna hold the wing onto the fuse, but really nice looking dihedral. Should help it make it easy to fly. Okay, so we've got uh, the Trojan manual here. So it's T28 operating manual. And then it says, note before updating the program, apply power to the reflex using ESC. And okay, that's kind of weird. So that's if you're gonna do an update to the software. So we'll look at that here shortly. Uh, we're not planning on updating the ESC actually, but if you need to, then that would be how you do it, I guess. That is so, Look at that. Oh, cool. It's so cool, but it's so cute and dainty. Yeah, it's so small. I had no idea it was gonna be so small. So it says FMS 7.6. So I love that it's painted. That's really nice. It's a robust, it's a nice prop, um, but very simple and small, which is cool. I mean, I definitely have a, a special place in my heart for small planes. I like big planes too, but the thing is when space is of concern, small planes are still equally amazing. And especially with reflex safe or AS3X or whatever stabilizer you like to use. Okay, so fixed gear, very detailed. Rock hard, of course, which is not necessarily good. There's a flat here that's gonna receive a set screw and that's gonna put that into the steerable nose gear. And it looks like we have a rubber banded USB-A to USB-C for reprogramming if you need to the reflex. So we'll just dump the rest of the Contents out, looks like these are the main gear. Looks super detailed for being very small, 1.75 inch tires, and it's held on by a C-clip. So if you were to replace these with something squishy, that would definitely make for a better landing. Let's just show you how to do this real quick because this will be super easy. This is just how hard it is to put the landing gear on. Whoops, grabbed the wrong one. 
or did I? Looks like, how does that work? Oh, it goes in there and then, excuse me. It goes in there and it slides over and then this slides up. Yeah, and then this thing snaps down. So very simple, kind of a unique way of putting landing gear on though. So this goes on the same way, which is sort of weird. I figured they would be uh, specific left, right. It's nice that it is toolless though. It is definitely toolless, which is super nice. Okay, so we have toolless and not hard to undo either. So that looks good. And they're squat, which T28 doesn't have super tall landing gear. So I love to see them short like that. That's the way I like landing gear that look realistic are always super appreciated on my end. But soft tires are even more. So we have three of these long screws and that's it. So that should be super easy uh, to do the assembly. Always check inside of here, make sure there's nothing in there. That stuff came out of one of these pockets. So I'm actually just gonna stuff that back in there. But always double check, like right here, that's our horizontal stab, okay? So horizontal stabilizer, looks like it's gonna have to be glued in there. And we have the control horn. Let's see how these are built. Okay, got a little bit of flex there. These things don't feel like there's even reinforcement on them. So that's a little bit disappointing, but it is a very small plane and this is extremely light. So pinch hinge on this, but it does have a lot of material there which is the better option. If you're gonna have a pinch hinge, you might as well have a lot of material because that's gonna be necessary to actually provide the mechanical strength for the hinge as well as actually for the horizontal stabilizer. Um, and now I'm just making sure we don't have anything else in any of these pockets. I think I got everything out. So now we take out the, the fuse and it looks absolutely glorious. Oh, that is so cool. That is really cool. A lot of little foamies on there. Okay, you can see the brushless motor up here, steerable nose gear adapter point. Of course, you wouldn't have to actually put the uh, landing gear on. Now, this does have a rudder, which is important, okay? So this is a four-channel plane. Uh, of course, there's not gonna be retract for you, but there is definitely, uh, there is an elevator, rudder, ailerons. So that's definitely a good thing. And then throttle, of course, that's gonna make up your fourth channel. Uh, and with the reflex, you're gonna have stabilization, and auto leveling available through that and we're just double checking there's nothing else on this always double check the bottom especially on some planes they actually put a lot on the bottom if you flip the box over so we'll just get that kind of out of the way for now and this build should be a pretty quick and easy build i don't know if you guys can see but it's like really windy and it's starting to get dark we had hoped to maybe be able to fly this today but i think we're just out of day um but i love the way that this thing looks. It is super light, which is super cool. And then of course you pull off the canopy and you can see inside, there is a big mess of wires. The ESC is well managed up here. It's got its own little pocket to sit in. It looks like two more metal gear, or excuse me, those are plastic gear, digital servos. And they do have the uh, compulsory warning here, small gauge wire that goes out to the actual uh, JST connectors. So if you're using um, you know, a, a smart battery or whatever, you're gonna have to have an adapter. So we'll take a look at that. I do not know if this ESC will handle 3S. I'm pretty sure it won't. And then also you see this lead. I don't like that that goes under. That is definitely coming out right now. Yep, it just came out. Okay, good. Cause yeah, I do not want that linkage rubbing along it. So yeah, so we have this all pre-wired on the reflex. So it says aileron, elevator, throttle, and rudder. Okay. And then it looks like over here we have channel one, channel two, channel three, channel four, and then S bus PPM mode. And then it says UART over here, which is a plug from this side, okay? So it looks like we're okay there. And then these are all labeled for us. So we know exactly how to terminate the leads on our receiver. Of course, this is gonna go to the battery. And uh, then this is gonna go to the elevator. Super simple, this goes to the rudder. Of course, this goes to the throttle and this goes to the mode. So you're gonna need a total of five channels because we have rudder, elevator, throttle, and then where's the ailerons? Uh, there's the ailerons are right here because the ailerons have to actually be landed onto the wing. They're gonna come up through the middle of the fuse here, uh, but I still haven't found the aileron. Where's the right, aileron plug? Right there. Oh, there it is. It just happens to be stuck up there by the ESC. Okay, so there's our regular channels, which there'd be five of them on this plane that we need to command and control from our radio, which is why we're using 
the AR620. Now, of course, there isn't really a five channel air transmitter right now. Uh, so because of that, we have to go with the six channel. And you'll also find that that's true having to go with the eight channel on a lot of the retract and flap equipped planes out there. Now, the cool thing is, because this is a six channel receiver, if you wanted to go ahead and add flaps, it's a pretty easy process to add because they don't have to go through the reflex. It's very simple. You basically cut these out here and then you would install either one servo centrally that would manipulate both sides simultaneously or you come out here and then you put your servo inboard and you would just make one linkage that would run this side and one small servo that would run this side. You could actually get away with a nine gram plastic gear but I would say you can actually probably do a three and a half gram servo, which would be super light. You'll add almost no weight to this plane. Um, so that's pretty cool. And there are some 3.5 gram. Um, and then there is, I think there was a five gram servo that you can get too. And, and they make them in a metal gear, which is really nice. Cause if you do a super small undersized servo, sometimes you can get away with a little bit more torque load uh, before they start stripping out. You still run the risk of actually burning out your motors though. So you want to be careful. So in terms of build, this should be a pretty easy build. I always cut off these safety warnings um, because I don't like that inside of my canopy. There's enough stuff going on in there, but I am going to be careful and mindful about cutting my fingers. Definitely in terms of safety concerns on radio controlled airplanes, the two big things we worry about are LiPo safety and then prop safety. So of course that's what we're going to watch out for. And then if you look at this prop, look how it's folded on the inside. You see that? Isn't that weird? Oh, right there. Weird. Focus. So the, the root of the actual prop is folded like that. So if you look at this, when that thing comes apart, it receives that. And I do not even know how this comes apart. That is so bizarre. I'm not used to seeing that style. So we're going to have to get a little creative to get that motor undone or to get the uh, prop adapter undone. So for now, we'll go ahead and grab our regular screwdriver set that should have flowers in it, but it doesn't. And we're gonna grab, I think it's a 1.5 millimeter to drive these. Oops, excuse me. I'm, I spoke out of turn, I think it's two millimeter. So we'll go ahead and get the wing mounted real quick. This is gonna be a super easy build. It's just more, I think we have to glue the tail in. So we'll have the camera crew's gonna check on that while I get screws ready. And uh, yeah, that was a two millimeter drive on that. Okay, so to build this wing, super, super easy. We basically take and key this in. We key this in like that, and we've got those two wires there. So I'm just gonna grab and just manipulate those until they kind of slide in. Um, it's always a little bit challenging the first time. You, sometimes you get a little memory on those cables. So all I'm gonna do is just hang them upside down and just make it until they kind of go through the hole and then slide in. And see, they keep falling out because I keep dropping. This thing is slick, so. I'm just gonna, if you could give them another angle so they can see where I'm lining up the wires, that'd be super handy. Okay, so you see how I got that in there? And there it is. And those two wires are fighting me now because of the nature of their position. I'm just gonna go up in here and push that. See how it's going over? So now when I try to seat this down, I'm gonna have to be able to grab those two servos because they're not otherwise going to let me through. So in order to do that, sometimes the best way to do it on a little radio controlled airplane is just use forceps, which of course are going to give us the ability to grab the tip of those connectors and then just yank them through. If you guys aren't familiar what forceps are, these are forceps or hemostats. They use them in surgery to, you know, lock off veins and arteries and stuff. And they've got a little click thing there and that holds the tip very, very tight. So like if you needed to hold this paper, you could hold it, but just keep in mind that, you know, it's got a very, very hard bite on it and it will grab and it can pinch and damage what you're grabbing. So if you grab wire, it's possible that you can actually cut through wire. So just be careful about that. Okay, now another trick is, if you're having trouble feeding that through, you could use forceps where you can get these in here because the head splits way back here. You can have a very small opening and grab those connectors and pull them through. But then the other trick of the day is you just unplug this Y cable. See how I unplugged that from the ailerons? And then you can come over here and you can, now it's, it's really not a huge issue which one you plug in. But if you're gonna do flaperons, 
which is where you program each of the ailerons to operate as ailerons and flaps, or spoilerons, where they operate as flaperons and spoilerons, as well as ailerons, then you will need to split these and not use a Y cable, and you'll need to not use the reflex because the reflex doesn't really support the use of flaperons. Uh, but you can do that on the AR620. You'll just lose stabilization. If you use an AR630, then you can have AS3X and SAFE that would give you the same function of reflex. Uh, but of course, you're going to have quite a bit more money tied up in your receiver, but you don't have to double everything up. So as you can see, that'll make this a lot easier to feed through. So I'll just flip the plane upside down now, get the cable to line up in the hole, and just kind of work it through a little bit. It's not, nothing too hard. And then once you've got the cable, you can hold that, but you need to be able to get the backing through. Okay, so now they're through, and I'm just going to line that up. You see, I got that little key get. Let me just pull the slack through. Real, real easy process. It's just mostly tricky because there's like three or four little small steps you have to take simultaneously. And then that wire, just kind of line it up with the brown and the orange, like the other ones, and stick it in the one that says aileron, okay? So the servo plug. Okay, so now all I need to do is basically get these screws dropped in here. Should be two of them. And I'm just realizing I kind of got like crap everywhere in my way. Okay, so we've got one and then two. And it was two millimeters to get that tightened down. It's a very simple process. Now I'm just sort of building this. Whatever comes into my hand first, I'm going to build. Okay. There's nothing really super hard about it at all. Now keep in mind, if you do add flaps to this plane, it's going to be very easy to add flaps to, but just try to pass your wire through here to make it easy on yourself. And if you could do one servo, maybe you do a 13 gram Metal Gear servo, which would be a similar size to this. And you, you want that point of actuation to be lined up in the center. Because if you have it over here, like if you center the servo in the opening, you're going to actuate here, which means your linkage lengths are going to be different and your geometry is going to be very complicated. So just line up your servo so it's offset here and have the throw right in the center if you're going to try to do two, okay? Otherwise, you can actually bring, uh, you can bring a servo out here or you can bring it right back here. I would suggest up here because it'll be easier to get your wires just chased through the same pocket. Now, I don't think we're going to add flaps on this right off at least, um, but it would be super easy to do and you do have a spare channel on the uh, receiver because you're not going to have any gains or anything to deal with. You're just going to have on off and you'll see, I'm just going to tighten this until I start to see puckering here. You can see where it's puckered here a little bit. That's how you can tell the wing is on tight. See how it started to pucker? So I stopped. Okay, so your main wing is on. That's super, super easy. Now, as for steerable nose gear, steerable nose gear is gonna go in here. And there's a set screw. There's a set screw and it looks like the set screws run all the way through. So I have to loosen that out first. And I think it's a 1.5 millimeter. <coughs> Excuse me. So the 1.5 millimeter, yep, 1.5. So you just back that screw off. Now, one bummer about this is you're gonna need a 1.5. Now that's keyed only on one side, so that tells you which direction it needs to go. So the oleo goes back, and of course the bogey goes straight in. And as you tighten this, it's gonna straighten the landing gear to the output shaft, okay? So it is keyed and it will matter in very nice looking landing gear. I love the way that looks. I mean, for being a very small plane, this is super light too. Now it's definitely not like UMX size, but it's, it's gonna be, you know, uh, probably a step between that, I would say, and a 1200 millimeter. Um, you know, there are 1300 millimeters and 1100 millimeter planes, and we've done quite a few of them, but we haven't done very many in the 800 millimeter size. We've done a few 750 millimeters, and we've not been happy with them. So I'm hoping that this one is gonna be the exception to the rule. It looks absolutely fantastic, like an exact miniaturization of the uh, 1.2 meter, which is one of my favorite planes um, that I have, and I love flying it. And the T28 has never left me wanting on any size that I've had. So really excited to see this one fly. Now I've got this, I've got just any random tool. In fact, I'm gonna specifically use a flat screwdriver just because I wanna make sure that I don't damage my other tool. And I'm just gonna brace this motor a little bit. Ah, see, I can't figure out how to hold that still. 
See, I got no way of reaching my fingers in there to get the motor to be braced as I try to spin this off because this is like a nut. It's actually got a nut installed in it and it's going onto the threaded shaft. But I'm having a hard time holding onto that. Maybe I can use forceps. Let's see if I can grab on back here. I just don't want to damage the finish. So I'm going to grab pretty hard and see if it'll, yep. See that, let me spin. Okay, see how small that shaft is? There's a nut zert that's inside the plastic. So that's normally metal, but this is plastic on this plane because it's so light and simple, okay? You see how big that is? This is gonna be one of those things you don't wanna to have to replace because it's gonna be definitely a custom proprietary part, okay? Look at that. That's cool. That is nice. See how it keys into the mm -hmm. wing, each of the props rather? And then same thing here, we're gonna slide that in. Okay, so that's definitely a different mounting technique. I've never seen them do it that way before. And then there's these two little keepers, okay? And so those are gonna cinch down all the way on top of itself and it looks like a model that you would have built as a kid. That's just amazing. And then look at the, um, look at the thickness of the prop shaft. It's just not very much there. So you need to be aware that as your prop shaft can be replaced though, um, you, this is actually on the bell housing. I think that shaft slides in. I don't know if it goes all the way through or not, but there's two set screws, one there and one there. So if you had to replace it, I believe you can. And then this is keyed. You see how it's keyed on both sides? So just try to get your alignment right so it makes it easier on you. And I'm holding on to the wing. I'm actually gonna grab, I can't tell if it's going in all the way this is the problem. The flat is on the top and the bottom. Yeah, that's all the way in. And as I tighten this, I'm gonna have to brace the whole thing again so I can tighten it in. I suppose I can hold onto the prop now. Oh yeah, that worked pretty good. Oh yeah, that's on there for sure. That looks so sweet as we're getting it done. Okay, so now the next thing we need to do, uh, just because it's gotta get done at some point, is we have to mount the, uh, the tail feathers. Now, Obviously there is an up and a, and a down and you should be able to tell that there's a control horn on here. And that's of course what transfers the uh, movement of these control horns to the elevator itself. So in the manual, it's gonna speak to what hole they want those in. It doesn't on this page yet. So basically that's gonna impact how much the elevator moves up and down. And so when you're gluing these tail feathers on, you have to be a little bit careful that they hold tight, but also that they're square. What's that? Is that the elevator or that the rudder? Is, it doesn't specify. It just talks about lining them up. Okay. Well, while you check that out, I'm gonna get some glue pulled out. So we normally use a product called Foam to Foam when we glue our multiple foam pieces together. Um, but we also use another product called Mucilage. And Mucilage is a Hobby King product and so we don't maybe use it quite as much as we used to. We had some quality issues with it and so we've just sort of gotten away from it. But also we had access to the foam to foam and it's been very good so we haven't had any issues. Um, previously we used a lot of that uh, Mucilage. But, um, you know, when you get a big, huge tube, it's like twice the size of this and it's basically not usable when you first open it up, it's pretty frustrating. So that just kind of dissuaded us from continuing in that pursuit. So this is the part that's gonna go inside right here in front of my pinky finger. And then of course this part here, and then this is gonna go through, but you can't guarantee. One of the things you wanna avoid doing is when you glue these together, if you know for sure that the two faces are gonna touch, you can glue the faces. But generally speaking, you're gonna end up having guaranteed contact point here and then all the way around. So I try to avoid putting a lot of glue on there unless I know for sure that I'm gonna hit and bottom out. Okay, so if you look through this wing, it's hollow, okay? So it goes all the way through. Um, at least at that step is what I mean. And so you could just test real quick and see if it's gonna fit. Now that thing is gonna be lined up and it feels like it's gonna to touch on the center because how, how you can tell is you can push hard and it moves. So that means we're gonna bite all the way through. Okay, so all I need to do is super easy. I'm just basically gonna uncap this stuff. You can see I'm almost out of it, which is too bad. This is an aluminized tube. That's one of the reasons why it lasts a long time is because basically if you have it opened, 
it's drying. If you have it closed, it stays good and it doesn't set up in the package. And that's part of the problem we've had with the mucilage is that sometimes it just sets up while it's in the package. And that's not acceptable for me. I wanna be able to actually use my products. Okay, so if you look at this, we'll spread that um, glue all the way along the surface and you're like, but you're just using the surface to do it? Yeah, nothing wrong with that. And then we'll just kind of each of these little contours, I'll just steal a little bit of glue for each of the contours there and a little bit there. Now, you see it's, it's tacky already. Give them a super close up shot so they can see what we're talking about. You see the little strings that are producing? Mm -hmm. Okay, now imagine up here, same thing is true because this is a contact adhesive, okay? So it's, it's gonna like really loosely hold right now, but it would actually dry and ultimately hold and you'd get a pretty strong bond eventually. But the best way to make this stuff work is to actually let that set and cook is what I call it. So it's like chemically reacting with just the ambient air. And so the best thing you can do is just let that cook for a few minutes. Now, I'm not gonna actually do a lot in here, but I am gonna do a little bit, okay? And I'm just gonna basically do like this, right? And then once I get that on there like that, I'm gonna cap off my glue and I'm gonna get a Q-tip and the Q-tip is gonna allow me to spread that glue so I get that maximum contact area. It's really pretty easy to do most of these steps we do in these unboxes but we just kind of want to touch on the high points. If you're a new pilot or a new um, you know, builder within the hobby, and when I say builder, I understand, I say that within the context of this is a foamy, you know, so I'm just spreading that on the bottom now. It's hard to see because it's clear on white, but just take my word for it. I'm coating the surfaces, very thin coating on this, not very much, and there's a lot less contact area on the top, so I'm not focusing on the top as much, but I am putting a little bit on there. And you don't want to let this set up too much because you're not going to be able to slide those control pieces in. And all I do is I just take and just coat this and it kind of spreads it out. And then when you're all said and done, you just throw it away and you're done and ready to rock and roll. Now this stuff is set plenty long. Now watch this. They're not even lined up right, okay? See that? Here's the crazy part. It's holding hard. Like I, I mean, I could probably hold up the plane with that now. So I'm going to leave that there just because I want to handle one at a time. And I'm gonna just find the hole and slide it in. And you see, it's already very difficult to slide in. If it gets so difficult that you can't slide it in, then you need to put some more of the glue on the surface and that glue will actually allow you to slide it in. It will lubricate that joint, okay? So you see that? I can barely get it to slide in because the contact area is so strong, okay? And I'm just gonna depress the top of the foam just a little bit on the top of the vertical stabilizer. And let's check for squareness. Looks pretty stinking square, that's awesome. And also you're gonna note, I'm just gonna do a test over the couch just in case I'm wrong, okay? So I just put that together. I just did it. And that slipped that much by yanking the whole plane on the weight of it. And there is never an aerodynamic time when your plane is hanging from the rudder like that or from the uh, uh, horizontal stabilizer. You might get some you know, dynamic loading on the elevator but it's gonna be bearing load evenly amongst all the surfaces of the plane. Uh, sometimes it's the upside, sometimes it's the downsize, sometimes it's you know the fuse, but there's never a time where you're gonna be holding the plane by that, unless you're storing it, okay? So that's what's so cool about that is this glue is plenty strong. You can go fly it right now and it would be fine. But usually I, I glue stuff first, but since it's gonna be dark, I'm not super worried about it. now. Noteworthy detail to bring up on this 800 millimeter and not surprisingly, there's no LEDs on it. Now, why are there no LEDs? Because LEDs add weight and cost and this is a pretty expensive plane. So they wanna hold down cost and they wanna hold down weight. Now that doesn't stop you from adding LEDs, okay? If you really like LEDs, which would be usually a nav light, you'd have uh, red on right returning. So like from your perspective, the red would be over here. You'd have a red light and you'd have a green light and um, Basically, I would probably do landing lights on here that would be on the front inboard and they'd be white and they'd be very bright and then probably a tail light if I could get away with it. Now, if you ever decide you wanna add lights and you're like, well, Brian, how do you do that? Well, here's the key and this is a super, super easy thing to do. What you'll do is usually when I was adding lights and I haven't added lights for a long time, but we have tons of videos in the old footage if you wanna look them, uh, look them up. In fact, we did it on a T28 from E-Flight, uh, version one, which is really old. It was like one of my first planes. Um, and we did them on a number of other planes. But anyway, all I do is I would just peel out this wire, I would just take a screwdriver and pull it up so I can get to it. And I would separate out 
Now, imagine I had pulled that up. So I would separate out these wires like this. I would just like literally take and separate with an X-Acto knife. I would just go between them. It won't actually cut through the sheath. And I would pull out the, the brown. In fact, I can show you right here on this extension cord. See, and you're like, but you just poked a hole through your line. No, I didn't. See, they just separate, see? Like that, I just do that. And then I just do this. And you're like, but why would you do that? That seems kind of stupid. Yes, that's right. It does seem kind of stupid until you tell what I'm doing. All I'm gonna do is all these electrical circuits are in parallel. So the positive and negative, this is the positive, the red one, and this is the negative. So it's the ground and this is the positive. So on a DC circuit. And then this is signal, okay? So when I want to power a device and I want it to not have to be a current, um, current limit, I don't want to necessarily have to do uh, a resistor for current limiting. The cool thing is you've already current limited your output on this and it's definitely five volts. Now you may also want a resistor so you can stop the LED from burning out quickly. Um, but generally speaking, if you have an unregulated load, you need a resistor in series with your LED, okay? So, and if you put the resistor on the wrong side on the negative versus the positive, it will prevent it from running. So you just have to guess and check until you get it right. Don't overthink it. So you steal the power here. You cut with your X-Acto knife straight down the same panel line and you just poke your wires through, lay them in, tape over the top or leave it or put a little bit of glue in and stuff it in there. You've got your red and black wire and you solder it and you just stick it in there and you're done. And then I used to do a drip of CA on there and sometimes I would do a drip of CA and then sand it and it would make the light distribute better or I would take hot glue, I'd do one drip of hot glue and then I would cover that with CA and it looks just like a, you know, an LED and a more expensive plane. But those LEDs are really easy to add. It's a fun little thing you can do. You can try if you're you know, just creative and wanna do that. Um, the other thing is if you need to add a resistor, in series, you can usually add that resistor somewhere back here, and then you've got a pocket where you can hide it. So it works really nice, and then same thing up here, you would just tap that same spot, and all you have to do is you take this wire, and you take strippers, and you just bite it with the strippers, but you pull back, and then you've got copper, and you can, you can take those wires that are, that are all pulled tight, and you just push them together, and it makes an opening. And then you take that opening, and you put your other wire through, and you wrap it around, and you're done. You don't even have to cut the wire. So then you run zero risk of actually, uh, you know, like causing that wire to be, sh you know, absent, not shorted, but absent. And usually what I would do is I would, you know, cut right here for one, and then I would come over here to the red and I would cut here, and then you'd have to worry about a dead short between the uh, ground and the, the power. So really simple way. And yes, we do have tons of videos about that from years past. We just haven't needed to do it because most of the planes that we would normally fly in low light conditions, this is like pretty much dark, but when we fly twilight, it is really nice to have those LEDs. Okay, so getting back to the point, sorry for the uh, detour there guys, but as you can see, uh, just with those couple minutes of explanation, you know, as I pull on this, that, that wing, it does wanna slip just a little bit, but I think we're okay still. And if you're ever in a real big hurry and you really, 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 really wanna fly, I'm gonna show you one other trick that's super easy and super effective and super fast. So we do this stuff in our kitchen, so you guys might not have access to this quite as easy, but we use a lot of toothpicks, and a lot of bamboo skewers, get those, have them on hand. If you're a new pilot, you can fix anything with that just about. Uh, so you just have a run of the mill. These are the kind of the square kind that are nicer. They're round and then they come to like this weird square tip. So I like those ones better than the alternative choices. Now, just kind of envision where all the different uh, mechanical things are going. So you're gonna have like a control tube that goes through somewhere and then another control tube and another control tube. And so suppose you're in a big hurry to fly. Well, one thing you can do is you can just take this and just find a spot and pin it, okay? So it's pinned. So now that thing won't come out. Um, and you know, you don't have to do this, but I'm just teaching you guys uh, another technique if you're in a hurry or if you had a repair and you're out at the flight field and you just really, really wanna fly, then this is just something you can do because you can glue it and then pin it. Now this thing weighs almost nothing, okay? I mean, it's not nothing, but it is almost nothing. You'd probably have to have, you know, five or six of them for a couple of grams. So I mean, very, very light, a few milligrams each. Okay, now you'll notice I'm doing it at an angle too. Now why at an angle? So I can, so I can get in there uh, to the center. 
and then I can bite. Now, if you were really, really worried about them coming out, you could also pin a second time and you'd be totally golden. Um, and then you're like, but now you have a big, ugly thing sticking out of your wing. Yes, you would be correct when you say that. And there's two ways you can handle that. The easiest way, of course, is to take side cutters. I usually have an X-Acto knife when we're doing projects like this. But uh, what I'm gonna do is I'll show you the easiest way. And you're like, but Brian, that is not gonna disappear. First of all, you probably wouldn't even see them anyway. You can push them all the way through, but that's hard because you've got this, you know, this sharp edge sticking up. You don't wanna get stabbed by it. This has a blunt tip, so we'll use that. And then you just push on the blunt tip against the sharp tip. And look at that, guys. It's like it never happened. You will never find that, okay? Um, except that I did it on camera for the world to see, okay? Now I'm actually gonna pull this one back just a hair. And you see, it doesn't even hardly wanna come out, which is just awesome. You feel how strong that is? So that's awesome. So now we just cut that tip off and then we can come back in here. So these are the types of little trips, tips and tricks that we like to share on Brian Phillips RC. If you guys are new to the Brian Phillips RC community or new to flying, uh, you're in the right place. We're gonna help teach you uh, some tips and we're also gonna help you maximize your RC budget. Now, you're probably thinking, but Brian, you keep reviewing like millions of planes and I want all of them. Yes, I understand the problem. Um, and that's what we're here to do is help you to sort through the millions of uh, amazing options. Like this is gonna be a great option. I mean, presumably it's gonna be great. We obviously haven't flown it yet and we don't try to BS too much on this channel. I mean, I love the FMS lineup that we've worked with in the past. And so I assume based on a lot of experience of many, many planes that this is also gonna be good. And so take it worth a grain of salt. We haven't flown it yet. This thing could be the biggest turd we've ever reviewed, but I kind of doubt it because I can just tell the way it's going together. I can tell it's got you know, hardly any weight to it. I can tell it's gonna CG out nicely. I can tell that it's gonna basically be a good plane. A Couple drawbacks on this plane I can already tell is that it's gonna fly on 2S. It's an unusual size for us. So we don't do a lot of 2S batteries. And so we might have to kind of dig deep for that. Now I'm really hoping it'll fly on 3S and I'm always, or not always, but usually willing to destroy a plane just to prove a point. And so maybe this thing will handle 3S okay, but we'll find that out in the course of uh, our review. But at the end of the day, we wanna teach you guys not only how to put them together, cause they're really not that hard to put together. You just go through the manual, follow the instructions. FMS has great instructions. Some of other brands that we work with have amazing instructions. We've never felt lacking on FMS instructions. So you're gonna be good there. Now, the other thing too that's nice if you're new to the hobby is that this thing has a stabilizer and it also has auto leveling and that's through the Reflex. The Reflex V2, in fact, uh, is installed in here. And so, yes, you of course have to supplement that with your receiver because that's what actually talks back and forth to your transmitter, which is sitting over there. But this stabilizer, once you've got your signal inside the plane, that thing alone, when you let go of the sticks, the plane's just gonna be impacted by wind and it's gonna go like that into the ground and crash eventually or into the nearest tree or whatever it is, okay? With the stabilizer, what's gonna happen is as you're flying along, there's gonna be some wind that pushes you this way and that, and the ailerons are gonna fight that on the roll axis. And then there's gonna be some wind that changes your pitch axis and it's gonna fight that. That's the stabilizer fighting that. And then there's gonna be some yaw interference, like when the wind hits stronger there than up here, or if you're turning and there's like an impact of gravity, it's gonna help resist that. Now it's not gonna stop gravity from having an impact on the trajectory of your flight. It's just gonna have impact on you, notwithstanding your thumb input, okay? So if you're sitting here and you're flying along, of course, this is where your elevator is on a mode two and roll and yaw. So if you go like this, the plane's gonna wanna go up. You want the plane to go up, right? You're pulling back on the elevator and it's gonna go up like this. Well, then the stabilizer's just gonna ignore that axis while you're giving input to a degree. And there's a weighted response, okay? And the stabilizer is programmed to allow you to have some input, some input and then it has other input. So like there's a percentage of input, like it's gonna, it's gonna take almost full control with no stick input. But then when you give it a little bit, it's gonna have a little bit less control. And if you give it a lot, it's gonna have virtually no control. And so that means that you are the pilot and it is a pilot too, to a degree. Okay, so it's just the stabilizer. So that just helps resist environmental impact like wind 
or you know thermaling where it's like you know hot air rising and it picks up the plane or maybe just going along the ground and having you know like grass bump the side of the wing or whatever it is so any environmental impact that is within the purview of control authority i mean you, you know it's not going to like stop a lava flow from going over the top of the plane and it's not going to stop an asteroid from hitting it okay it's not going to be enough output so there's another function in there called auto leveling and well it's actually not called auto leveling it's like stability plus or whatever i don't even know what they call it but what's going to happen is normally when you let go of the sticks on a plane it's just going to kind of veer it's just going to find the path of least resistance and the stabilizer is even going to be working but it's just going to slowly kind of drift and eventually it's going to almost always find its way down at some point point. and people say thumbs off the sticks or fingers off the sticks hands off the controls they don't mean actually let go of the control and they want that plane to fly straight and level and that's good that's a well-trimmed plane but with the stabilizer it's eventually going to still allow that plane to eventually drift down over over something like that okay with auto leveling on the plane is is going to keep its spatial awareness so it keeps it level and the ailerons are going to right the aircraft when you let go of the sticks and when it, you like say you push it down with the elevator and it's in a, a, a dive well if you let go it's just going to level the plane and it does it really really quick now that happens in addition to stabilization now with the reflex you can also turn that off so when i refer to the different modes that's what this plugs for s bus ppm mode okay now s bus speaks to or oh they, they're missing a letter the s bus is actually speaks to a serial bus of data that would command all the six channels that are necessary through one plug and it just uses all the information gets transmitted and all the positional controls are then reliably communicated through that one wire okay now in our case we're just going to plug in each of those wires here but what's going to happen is those modes are going to be stabilizer off and then auto leveling if we do it normal because we don't have retracts and i would normally assign this switch to retracts i'll probably go ahead and switch it this way so it's going to be like stabilizer normal and then stabilizer with auto leveling as well but i'm not going to make an off setting i generally don't fly my planes without a stabilizer so and i don't consider it cheating or anything and you shouldn't either. Every flight aid that you need as a new pilot is going to be what you want to use. And if anybody tries to dissuade you and they say it makes you somehow an inferior pilot, well, just remember, everybody has to start somewhere. And if you would like to ultimately fly without a stabilizer, that's fine, more power to you. And there's nothing wrong with that. I, if you love the way it looks without a stabilizer, then fly it without a stabilizer. But if you love the way it looks with a stabilizer, by all means, fly it with a stabilizer. It really doesn't matter. And it shouldn't matter to you what somebody else likes. Um, it is highly preferential, um, I, I think. And so most people do like the way a stabilizer makes the plane look because it looks very realistic. It goes straight. It doesn't do a lot of herky-jerky with the wind. And also it's a little bit like it's a little bit less size dependent. So if you have a huge plane, it's not gonna be as environmentally impacted as much uh, by the same exact wind circumstances as otherwise a small plane might. And so what some people say is that the stabilizer makes a small plane fly like a big plane. I don't necessarily go so far as to say that anymore because I've learned a lot about the way they work. In my experience, they just all fly a little bit easier. It doesn't make it easy to fly, and I don't wanna give you guys a false representation of the truth, but the reality is auto leveling makes a plane a lot easier to fly. Stabilization takes the edge off. It makes it a little bit less wacky. And if you get the CG wrong, it really helps to make it flyable so you can get it to the ground, make adjustments. And the CG is important because the pitch axis is controlled by changing and pivoting the plane on a certain axis now the same is true on the roll axis and the yaw axis but most people don't worry about those things they just worry about the center of gravity as it pertains to the elevator because it's one of the most important primary control surfaces okay so when you go to take off you know you shouldn't even really have to use the elevator to take off it should just kind of lift off the ground right but in practical reality you pull back on the stick and it goes up like this you point it up you let go what you're doing is you're changing where the plane is pointed you're not necessarily 
you know, like changing the airflow so drastically that you go over there, that'd be like a thrust vectoring solution. So in this case, all you're doing is just changing the position of the plane on the plane, ironically, pun intended, okay? So the same is true with the rudder, the same is true with the ailerons. You're just changing positionally where the plane is, okay? But it's always moving forward. So as a result of that forward motion, in connection with the position of the plane, you make a maneuver. So anyway, uh, getting back to the point, going into the weeds a little bit on this because it's a newer plane, or excuse me, it's a plane that could be conceivably for a beginner. And so we try to do that here on Brian Phillips RC. We hope we don't bore you too bad. If you guys are more experienced pilots, please bear with us because remember, you were a new pilot at one point and you would have liked to learn some of this stuff as a new pilot. And so obviously, we know one of the hardest things that you're up against right now as a new pilot, and I do clean up while we're talking, interesting, right? Um, is that you're thinking to yourself, I need to know all these weird acronyms like gyro and AS3X and SAFE and all these different things. Well, that's why you're here on Brian Phillips RC, so we're gonna help teach you uh, what those acronyms mean and, and you know whether or not it's actually an important function um, that you should learn about. Maybe it's important enough to pay money for because when you buy a receiver, I don't even know what to buy. I'm not even sure what brand to buy. Does it matter what brand? What brand are you using? Well, this is called Spectrum. It's a Horizon Ho Hobby product, which would be um, like these planes over here or, or that plane over there. And then those are, that's an FMS there, that red one. And we're gonna help teach you that over time, but that's not super crucial. Uh, what brand the planes are, but what's important is what transmitter you use, because this speaks a certain protocol, and the protocol is just a list of series of steps, controls, if you want to think of it that way, that allow this device to talk to this device. Now, they both talk both ways, and they both listen both ways via telemetry. So telemetry is feedback from the receiver to the transmitter. There's very limited telemetry on this. There's a lot more now than there used to be, but it's still quite limited. You could get lots of telemetry that would tell you airspeed, altitude, uh, battery pack voltage, BC voltage, all sorts of crazy things that are really helpful to you on the ground that you can see while it's happening in the air. Okay, now we usually just depend on timers for most planes, but then since with the advent of the better telemetry, we've been able to almost eliminate timers on most of the new bind and fly platforms, okay, which is pretty cool. So now FMS is one brand and it comes as a plug and fly, which means you have to provide this thing. Whereas this one is a bind and fly. So you just bind it to the transmitter in there. And you're like, what do you mean bind? Like I'm used to crystals and stuff. Well, this has a little button on it. And then if you don't have the button, there's actually a thing that's, it's a, it's a bind plug, okay? So the bind plug is basically a little servo cable that shorts the ground to signal, not power to signal, but ground to signal. Okay, so you open this thing up, it's very simple looking. Look how small that is. It weighs almost nothing, of course. And yes, you can save weight if you wanna take the case off if you have a small application. So there's a push button in there, and that's the bind button. It used to be that it was a bind plug, and I always called it a bind plug, or a bind button, uh, just by accident. Um, and this is gonna then communicate to this via the radio, and this has larger antennas in it. There's also an antenna in the handle. Okay, so that's called a diversity antenna because there's two of them that both, I believe on this, the diversity is for reception of data and then the transmission is going out one antenna. Okay, now same thing here, and you're like, where's the antenna on that, Brian? Well, the antenna is actually a trace that's on this board, and you can't see it very good on this, but if you flip it over and you were to shine a light, you might be able to see a trace and it just looks like a little wiggle back and forth on the board. And it's very small because it works effectively for very long range. And they say lar longer than, um, how do they say it? Beyond line of sight. That's what the, the nomenclature they use. Uh, but just so you guys know, these things can go miles. Maybe not the 620, but the 637T, um, you know, that thing can go a long time, long ways. Okay, now how long can this go? I don't know, as far as you want. You can do a range test where you drop the power by 10, by an amplitude of one tenth. You should be putting out one tenth of the power and you can see where it breaks contact. That's what a range test is. We don't ever show it because it's like a super boring thing and we don't, <clears throat> we don't ever do it. So 
but we have done it. We have done it. Okay. It's just few and far between because we trust our equipment and we're not sitting here next to a cell phone tower or anything like that. Um, okay. So now mounting this thing, do you have to mount this thing inside the plane? Not this style because it's not spatially aware. It's not doing stabilization or auto leveling. But if it was doing AS3X and safe, you would need to mount it in a, a place, you know, generally around the center of gravity is a good idea, but it can actually be mounted sideways. It can be mounted upside down. And then it learns its position uh, with regard to gravity and flat on the ground. And that's how it does the auto leveling. That's one part of how it does it. But in this application, it's very simple because all we have to do is plug all this crap in and then throw it in where it can fit. And usually what I'll try to do is just kind of get an idea of where I think it's going to go and then just keep keeping in mind that this linkage is going right through the middle of all the action. And then also you're going to have a battery that you need to manipulate in there. And, and you're like, but then how do you know how to set this up? And do you need to set this up? Well, actually, good question. Uh, you don't really have a lot of setup on these, but we still need to set up the transmitter so that we know what channels do what functions. Like, you know, we have to control the ailerons, which is one channel. We have to control the elevator, which is another channel. We have to control the rudder, which is another channel. We have to control the throttle, which is another channel. And then we have to control the mode, which is another channel. So that's five total channels. Well, which channels which? Because these are numbered. You must have to know. You can't just plug them in anywhere. True. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you the next part of this video is what we call our radio setup part. So we're done with the build. It's done. Um, we might mark the center of gravity a little bit later, which would be part of the build, but still, you get the idea. So the next step is to actually power on the transmitter. And once we power on the transmitter, we can start setting up a new profile for this plane, okay? So I'm gonna hit back and escape, or back and cancel, and I'm gonna go to add new model, and it's gonna show a picture of what looks like an acrobatic plane, they call it an acro. So we're gonna accept that as opposed to one of these other choices. Okay, now templates, you can build templates that you always start from. If I wasn't doing videos, I would build a template and I would always start from a template, it'd be so much easier. Bind and fly is where you actually, with Wi-Fi, I currently have off. It will download from Horizon Hobby or whatever brand um, is, it would have to be a Horizon Hobby model because this is a Spectrum offering, which is a Horizon product. Um, so FMS is not so much competitive with Horizon, but it is not the same company, okay? And some of the planes that are offered by some of the big brands are made by FMS. So it's actually a great, reputable brand. They have good factories, they make good quality planes, and they make them for a long time, which is what we have come to expect and demand from these people, okay? So uh, what was I just setting? Well, bind and flat. Well, you were setting the... That was weird. Did it time out on me? So have. system setup, disconnect RF, model select, add new model. I'm going to go to create. So it evidently it times out if you don't pick something. Okay. So you also note that that little orange light shut off. That orange light is representative of a connection in the RF. So the radio is actually on when that light's on. You also notice it took a long time for that to happen. That's normal. We're up to like 120 some odd models when you have less models a little bit quicker. Okay, model select would take you right back to the menu where you can pick your model that you've already previously created or add a new one. Um, you can also do that in model utilities down below. But in this case, uh, model type, that's what we just chose. If you change this, it'll reset everything. So don't do that unless you have to. Then this is a model name, just full disclosure, plane number 123. Okay, so as you can see, and I'm using a legacy keyboard. You don't get that factory, you have to do that in system setup. So I'm going to type in a model name. So if you see on the side of the box, you can see it's an FMS 800 millimeter T28 V2. So I'm going to type in T28 um, Trojan 800 millimeter. I'm not sure what I'll type, but I'll show you what I type and we'll come right back when I'm done scrolling it in. Okay, so I just keyed in the T28 Trojan 800 millimeter and I put FMS. It's actually a V2. So if I had room, I'd put V2. And the only reason I do V2 is because this happens to be a V2, but the more important part is the size because chances are you're not gonna have more than one that's a V1, V2, but you're likely to have another T28 because T20 is a very popular Warbird. And yes, an 800 millimeter Warbird would be a smaller size, but we have a 1.2 meter. I'd like to have a 2.1 meter at some point and then some more um, if, uh, favor. Well, I think we're going to do a 1400 millimeter and probably a 1700 millimeter mm -hmm. because I love the T28. It's like one of my favorite flying platforms. So, okay. So I'm going to walk out. You'll notice it beeps. There's that little dot that doesn't ever go away. Which, who cares? It doesn't really matter, but I have noticed it's a glitch. 
Um, and that's been since we started on the NX6. We're on mm -hmm. the NX8 now. Okay, so aircraft type's already been, s well, it's pretty simple. There's an uh, aileron, a, an aileron servo, and a tail and vertical stabilizer in standard configuration. So of course you could put in whatever you've got. Now this, you can't just set flap runs. You have to actually separate and have two channels controlling it. That's where I said you wouldn't have this Y cable, okay? So this Y cable would have to come out and you'd have to have probably uh, two extension cords. So you'd have one that's plugged into the stabilizer and you'd have one that's actually plugged in directly to the receiver. But just keep in mind, you can't really do flap runs effectively with a reflex, okay? You need to basically use a safe equipped receiver if you wanna do it right, okay? So, and, if, and by the way, outboard flaperons kind of suck, okay? I know that some of you guys are gonna disagree with me and that's okay, there's room for disagreement in this hobby. We don't all have to think the same way. But I'm just gonna tell you my opinion is that they suck. Inboard flaps are more effective at producing drag lowering the stall speed, changing or allowing the change of the pitch angle of the plane without gaining speed. Whereas you don't lose control of the plane because this goes down and then you maintain full pitch and roll and yaw authority of your aircraft. So the control surfaces don't change that much. Also, you have the elevator compensation is opposite when you have an outboard flapper on, okay? Which is weird and it, it causes people to have issues with elevator compensation in a flat mode. It's not that big a deal. You just figure it out on the first time and then it's set. But my experience is that it's not effective to the same extent that you would like them to be. Now, is it better than nothing? Most of the time, no, in my opinion. But if you have a full length flap on, totally different story. Or if you have a mostly inboard, or if you have a flap on that would be like a real plane, like on this F-16, we had flap rons as well. Now, flap rons, on especially on jets they have more of like a wing that's part of the fuse and so the way that the aerodynamics work they just work better i still would like an inboard flap on an f-16 but that's not the way the f-16 is configured because on the real life they have leading edge droop or leading edge flap so the leading edge flap which is on the front of the wing operates like a flap and then the ailerons continue to operate as flapperons and spoilerons and it's all managed by an onboard control uh, computer so on this application, inboard flaps would be the way to go if you really wanna slow the plane down more. My guess is it's gonna slow down fine. And we can also do things like slipping where we slow it down and we'll actually turn the plane, we'll point, we'll point at the ground like this to come down and then we'll actually yaw the plane like this and then we'll use ailerons to counter that. So you can also come in and crab to fight wind where you fly contrary to the straight path that you think you're gonna go. And then when you get ready to touch down, you can turn. Well, I'm talking about with no wind, you come in at an angle, you fly something like this or like this, you, you, counter, you counter the full yaw effect with the ailerons. And what that does is instead of flying like this, you produce a bunch more drag and you fly like that. So, oops. This thing is pretty rock solid, so I'm happy with it so far. Okay, now getting Can, back to the point. Since you're talking about flap rounds and flaps and stuff, uh -huh. if you added flaps, you would just, you can still do that with Here, the reflex. I'll show you. Yes, and, and what would happen is you would just use the sixth channel mm -hmm. or the fifth channel or whatever you have it set to, and you would just go like this. You would just set it up like that, one aileron, one flap, and then you would have that channel. So like we could set up the flaps and just not hook them up, and all you would do is you would just change your wing type to that, okay? Because the reflex is only gonna know what you send to it. And the reflex doesn't stabilize no. the flaps. There's nothing to stabilize on the flaps, okay? So you would just use one of the additional channels and you would make your setup in that regard. Okay, so I'm gonna just put that back though. We have done a bunch of flap installs on this channel and there's a few different planes that you could look back to. But in most cases, if there's flaps on a plane, we set them up and you can watch any of those videos. Now I am gonna change this picture too uh, because there's a T28 on here. There it is, cool. Okay, so now flight mode setup we don't need to mess with. Uh, spoken flight mode, you can make it tell you verbally some of the different things. You can also do switch conditions. You can do flight modes that have an audible um, connection. So like if you have flight mode one, flight mode two, flight mode three, the big thing that you want with flight modes is there are certain controls within the spectrum environment for their safe receivers that do require flight mode changes. But also flight modes are nice because you can tie different trim, trim, 
two different flight modes. So if you have one flight mode where you know, you're flying super duper fast and you want the trims to be different, or if you have uh, you know, like literally a different uh, geometry on the wing, like on an F-14 where the wings sweep, you're gonna want different behavior from different control surfaces. And also you may need different trims, okay? So that's what flight modes are for. And you can set up a, just a plethora of flight modes, okay? So I'm gonna walk back out. Okay, we're gonna start with dual rates and expo. This is a highly subjective matter, but I'm just gonna go ahead and show you the way I set up. And I would recommend fly like this, try it, see how you like it. And then if you don't like it, this is in lieu of doing dual rates and, and you know having like a high rate, low rate, which a lot of guys do like 100% rate and a 70% rate or 100% rate and a 75% rate. I do it like this. I have one switch instead of tying like up three switches, because believe me, if you're a new pilot, you're not gonna have enough mental power to be screwing with three switches. You're gonna get confused, you're gonna forget which one's which, you're gonna cause an accident, 100% guarantee you. So just set it up simple. We've got very low expo, 5%, almost nothing. Then we have 10%, it's enough to be noticeable, but it's not tons. And then we have 20%, and we also drop the rates from 100 down to 90. So you can see the way that the chart shows that. So as I move the aileron stick, there is a point where it stops going out. It's gonna maximum output is 90, okay? Now here you can see my input's 90-ish percent and it puts 70 something percent out, okay? And then you get to the middle of the stick, it softens the stick because you have 20% before it catches up to itself. See how it's 13? There is gonna be a time where your output is exactly the same as what you would do without Expo, okay? See how it's getting closer and closer? See, we're almost all the way to the end. And because the rates drop down, you never actually fully catch up, okay? But if I'm in this normal mode, watch this, 10% expo, when I move the stick. Now, this is a feel thing, so you guys are gonna have to probably take my word for it. If you're a new pilot, you won't understand this. You're gonna say, that seems highly unusual and unnecessary, and you would be wrong, because you will be amazed how much better it feels to fly a plane with a little bit of expo. It will take out this, this, this is so hard for new pilots, hard for experienced pilots, because you have throttle and you have a rudder, okay? And it's hard to go in a straight line and not deviate from the center path, okay? It's hard to do that. Um, even for experienced pilots, because it's a muscle memory thing, it's a muscle strength and conditioning thing. And as you get more skilled, you're gonna get used to it. But the same is true with this and this. You have a shared control between the elevator and the ailerons, okay? This is spring-loaded. This is spring-loaded, but that's not, okay? Just so you know, in case you're wondering. You can also have detents. There's adjustment screws here, 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 and here to make some adjustments. There's also an adjustment there as well. And you can tighten those and it'll make it click, 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 click little bumps as you go. I like it to be relatively smooth. I kind of need to tighten mine a little bit. It feels too smooth to me. Okay, so down here you can see 110, that's the normal middle setting, 90 and 20, and then 105 is my low setting. So low meaning I speak to my expo setting, okay? Then I'm gonna go from aileron to elevator and I'm gonna do the exact same setting. I have to make a switch assignment to switch F, that's why I highlight the on, and then I change it in the low setting, then I set my middle setting, and this is where I'm gonna take off, and this is where I'm gonna go if I need more. And if I were ever to switch here because I felt like the elevator was touchy, then I would come in and set my elevator to, now that would be 90 and 20. And then this one would be, you know, maybe like 85 or 80 or 75 and 40. So I I'd go in steps of whole steps, okay? So then this would be like 10 and 100. Then this would be 20 and 90. And then this would be like 40 and say 75. Okay, something like that. So then you have this like logical, easy to switch thing, okay? And you can half it or you can double it. So you start in the middle and you give yourself an out. As a pilot, you're always trying to work to give yourself an out. Okay, so rudder, same thing. You see how it says on, we're gonna highlight that and we're gonna scroll, and we're just gonna actually move the switch and it'll automatically highlight that for you. Now you can also highlight this and just change it that way too, but I prefer to just move the switch. It's a lot quicker, and then you click to acknowledge your entry by having flicked the switch. Okay, so we're gonna go up to five, then we're gonna go to 10, then we're gonna go to 20, and then you're gonna go to 90, okay? 
So there's your lowest setting of Expo, which would be the most touchy. This would be where you're gonna take off, which would be kind of like muted somewhat. And then this is gonna be your, your next setting up, okay? So it's gonna about double it, and then it's also gonna drop the rates a little bit. Now, why do I prefer Expo over rates? Rates are going from maximum throw to less than maximum throw. Now, doesn't seem like a big deal when you're just flying around doing loops and stuff like that until doing a loop means that you're gonna like hit the barn or you're gonna hit a tree or you're gonna hit the ground because you need that extra 8% to get out of the loop. That's why I prefer more Expo. So as a, as a beginner especially, see the cat? I thought the cat was climbing the, the glass, that was weird. <laughs> so when you, when you give full stick input, I want full deflection, whatever it is, okay? Now there are times when your plane is just so dang touchy that it's like way overkill. Um, and there's also times that you have a plane that's very fast and you don't want to over control it to the point where you high speed stall the wing. Now my experience as a pilot is that I would rather be able to screw up the plane myself because when you're going slow, you need more output than when you're going fast because the air that's going across the surface is there's less of it. There's less volume of fluid going across the control surface. Okay. So just take my word for it on the expo, run it this way, start in the middle and you'll be like, wow, I need more. Start in the, start in the bottom then make the bottom your middle and then you can go even more, but always have an out. Okay. So now we're done with dual rates and expo and that stands for dual rates and expo. And so we try to teach you the why and not just the how on Brian Phillips RC. That's one of the things that I was frustrated with when I started flying is a lot of people showed you how to do settings, but they never told you why or how to do it. Actually, they didn't tell you how or why. So we're trying to do both. Okay, throttle cut, why? Because it's a safety issue. So throttle cut, I want that toward my belly. And then we acknowledge the H and you see how this throttle, this monitor shows you what the position of your stick is, but it says zero, right? Now, when I shut off throttle cut, look what happens. Now it springs to life, hold still. See how it springs to life there? Now throttle cuts on. Now, you can show them from back here now. When I'm carrying this on a lanyard, which I often do when I'm flying, pretty much all the time, I have a lanyard holding it, and that way I can let go when I can demonstrate things with my hands or talk with my hands, which I do a lot of, or hold the plane or whatever it is, and get the canopy off, whatever it is. Switch H is pulled toward my belly, okay? I'm less likely to bump it and undo that condition. You see how awkward that was? Because of this, this gets in the way. Now there are some transmitters without a handle there and there's some with folding handles and there's some that don't have handles at all or they're embedded handles. So you just need to use your best judgment. For me, I've determined that toward me is the safest way. Now I do have a lanyard that could bump that. So you never totally trust and that's why you always hear me saying out loud with my mouth, throttle cuts on and tested. That means that I gave throttle and it didn't move the motor, okay? So that means that I can trust it as far as, you know, I can put my hands and wrists and, you know, tendons and bones and muscle and all this stuff next to a little prop. Now this prop is small, but make no mistake, that can put you in the hospital. I guarantee it. And it could kill you if you're really dumb, but it's not going to. It's just gonna hurt really bad and you're gonna be pissed off and you won't be able to fly for a long time because you're gonna have stitches all over in your hands and you're gonna have blood all over your kitchen. It's gonna be disgusting and I don't wanna see pictures of it. So please use the throttle cut, build the habit now. Yes, it is just like anything else. It is, it is no better than great habits except marginally because marginally better meaning that the machine will only fail you know, in a, a, a nuanced case. Whereas the vast majority of the time it's working. So this is the part where you're gonna get cut. Instead of this part, you're gonna be vulnerable to getting cut. You understand? So like instead of a you know, 2% exposure where there's like some mechanical flaw that causes that not to work, whether it be a lanyard or laying it down and making a mistake, um, you're still protected a lot more of the time. So it's like wearing a seatbelt, okay? Except, you know, maybe not quite as important as a seatbelt. Um, and I don't want to be nanny here. You guys can make your own decisions. But at the end of the day, this is a really easy one. Build the habit. It's a good habit to have. And when you start getting into planes that are 17, 1800 millimeters, and you know, you got props that are 14, 16 inches long, and they're going like hundreds of miles an hour, and they're actually going to cut your hand off. You don't want to be that guy, okay? 
Um, and just keep in mind, it's a really safe sport. You know, just keep it that way. It's easy. It's and easy if, if you're teaching kids, like it's just automatic for our son. Yeah. Like he doesn't even think about it. He just uses throttle, throttle cut. cut. He says it And if it there too. isn't a throttle cut, yeah. I notice because I bump it. And you don't think about it, but yeah. you're just moving around. And you're like, how hard can it be to not hit the throttle? Just mark my words. You will hit your throttle. Or you'll start a plane and you'll have the throttle up like 2% or something and you won't recognize it. This will warn you before it activates the rudder, uh, before it activates the RF. Okay. So there's a lot of different things to keep in mind. That's one of them. It's very easy. Make it, make it, you could, you could be totally brain numb and you'll still do it. Okay. Make it happen. Um, okay. So anyway, so that's that very, very easy. That's called throttle cut. It's called throttle hold on a helicopter. So sometimes I interchange those words. And so my apologies. The reason it's called throttle hold on a helicopter is because your pitch is also tied to this stick. So it just stops the motor. It doesn't stop the pitch change because you can actually run a helicopter with no throttle um, and you can fly it to the ground with no throttle. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it because it'll, roto it'll auto gyro, okay? Throttle cuts on. Okay, now we're gonna continue on. We have analog switch setup, digital switch setup, mixing. We're not gonna do any of that crap. If you wanna do one thing that's new, um, that's gonna help you as a new pilot, you can go into mixing and they have this uh, rudder to aileron to elevator, and then they have aileron to rudder. I'm just gonna say aileron to rudder. And what's gonna happen is when you, okay, I'm gonna just turn it on. See how it says all these switches? I just want it to be on, so just go over one rather than clicking. When you click, then that sets it to a switch. You can have it set to a switch, but I would prefer in this case to just have it on. Okay, so once it's on, well, that's kind of weird. I guess I'm gonna set it to a switch and see if it'll let me. Okay, you see that? See, now it brings up my percentages. I don't really understand why. There it goes, now it's on. Okay, see how it's available now? Okay, so you can click and you can scroll that in. Let's say we have a 50% roughly, okay? Now what's that gonna do? When I move this stick, you can see the ailerons indicated here, okay? That's called a monitor, by the way. And then this is the rudder, okay? So when I move this stick to 100%, you get 49 because it was at minus one, okay? So 100 yields 50. Now watch this, minus 100 yields minus 50, one, okay? So basically when you move the stick and you can see that box moves to whatever you're highlighting. So like in this condition, that's what we're, we're talking about, okay? So when I roll to the left, then there would also be a yaw that comes in. So now what's that gonna look like as the plane's flying? You're gonna roll to the left and then the rudder is gonna yaw the plane. So that's called a coordinated turn. So it's a way to automatically coordinate your turns. Now, what's good about that is that as a pilot and especially a new pilot, you're gonna be flying with aids like safe or like auto leveling through this reflex. And you're gonna to have to really work to coordinate your turns because the controls are dampened in that system, okay? And so if you coordinate your turns with that, it's gonna make it look cooler. Also, you should just get in the mode while you learn to fly of moving both sticks a little bit when you're new. So when you engage in a roll, you give it a little bit of rudder. But usually there's a small delay if you want it to look right, and then there's also elevator. So you engage a roll by rolling the plane in a real plane and you hold your heading, you hold your altitude and you use the elevator to negotiate to a heading and then you unroll and then you let off the elevator, okay? Also, you coordinate with the rudder, but generally on a big plane, you could be going like this and you could use the rudder to do that, but really it doesn't really change your heading. It just changes the position of the plane in the air. It's very weird actually. And you can run a plane like this, flying that way in that heading. It's very strange, okay? But I mean, there is a point where it's just gonna start turning the plane too. But generally, you're gonna roll the plane and you're gonna pull back on the elevator and gravity is gonna help you. You're gonna get to the heading and then you unroll and you put it this way and it goes that way, okay? Elevator plus rudder. It's three coordinates of control. So to coordinate a turn is to turn the plane and point the nose where you want it. Now you'll notice when I'm flying, it looks generally kind of level um, and, and I'll go into coordinated turns and I'll talk about it as I fly. And that's to help you guys as new pilots and more experienced pilots so you know what I'm doing. Um, and then you can say, okay, well, how did the plane respond? Cause like you can't see my sticks and the plane at the same time. And most people want to see the plane. Some people do small picture in picture. We don't do that because it's not necessary most of the time. 
So anyway, the big thing is coordinating the turn and it's on an automatic basis. Now, what's the drawback of coordinating like this? One drawback, and that is you may not want to coordinate the turn, okay? So like, let's say you're doing a barrel roll, okay? Or you're doing like a roll. So you want to roll the plane over. Well, what happens if you add a bunch of rudder in there? You're going to roll quicker, but you're also going to positionally change the plane. So instead of rolling like a tight roll like this, it's going to be more of like a, it's going to be more like you'll have to like do one of these, hmm. okay? Now, I'm not saying that's a problem. It's just the fact of life. Now, you can have this mixed in and you could just counter it a little bit like that, okay? But I wouldn't recommend it. For that reason, I say use a little bit, maybe 25% as a new pilot. But I'm not a new pilot, so I'm gonna do 15%, okay? Just take my word for it. You guys may really, really like that. So do 25%, see how it feels. Okay, and that's one mix. You can also do tons of other mixing. There's your range test, by the way. See, full power, equal test distance. And then what you do is you hit the bind button, reduce power. And when you let go, and then you just like move the sticks and it operates exactly the same as it always was, except that RF is gonna be reduced drastically, okay? And then when you stop seeing the control surfaces move, you have a, a friend or whatever on the phone on the other end of the line or yelling across the yard and you know, you go out 100 steps or 200 feet or whatever you think it is that you want and then you multiply that by 10. So if you're like, okay, those trees are like, you know, a quarter mile away, that's a long way. You're not gonna probably run into the trees that are playing this size, you're gonna lose sight of it, okay? But what you do is you figure out how far you wanna go out and then you multiply it by 10. So you don't have to walk a mile out, you just walk out a 10th of a mile, which a 10th of a mile is still like 500 feet. So it's a long ways, but I mean, I'm not gonna do, 500 feet anyway, I'll do like 100 feet or something like that. And then you multiply by 10, okay, I got a thousand foot range, any direction around me in a 360 degree orbit. I'm not gonna fly below me that much, but in our application, we do have a little bit of a bowl over here we fly in. So we do have some down, we have some up, and we have some out. Okay, all right, getting back to the point. So range test, we're not gonna mess with anymore. Timer, this is where you can start a timer automatically. I'm gonna set a five minute timer. I'm gonna start it with one out, so when I go over 25% threshold, it's gonna start the timer and it's gonna keep counting. You can also leave that off. So it just only counts when you're over the threshold. And then when you go below the threshold, it stops the count. Some people prefer that, it's just personal preference. Okay, tell them. I'm gonna do voice here, it's gonna say one minute remaining. I'm gonna do nothing at 20 and I'm gonna do tone and vibrate for the countdown. Oh, excuse me. Uh, voice. Yeah, just voice. And then I'm gonna do tone and vibrate from expiration and then a tone every minute thereafter. And then that's pretty much it. And then we can just be ready with bind. Now, we did all that. I'm gonna clear the timer with the cancel button or the escape button. And this tells us where to hook our wires up. Okay, so you can see throttle, aileron, elevator, rudder, gear, aux one, aux two, aux three, which these two don't exist. So now where do we hook them up? How do we know that based on this? It says channel one, two, three, four, five, six. And then if you look really close, there's a raised bump and it says minus plus S. So S is at the top, so it's away from my belly. So I speak about where my belly is because that's where we're filming in relative. Uh, and you should be able to easily equate those uh, from your reference and vantage point. So I wanna untangle first power cord. That's not an issue for us. And that's of course the Predator ESC, which is a 20 amp ESC. I don't know if that's gonna be enough for, four, or for 3S. Uh, since it's rated as a 2S plane, I don't think it's probably gonna do it. So ailerons. So ailerons are where? The second channel. So throttle's the first one. And there's a brown, red, and orange. How do you know what's what? You know because I tell you. Um, or you can look it up. This is Hextronics color code or JR, or excuse me, uh, this would be JR Hextronics. And that's just the different colors. And then we need auxiliary one or gear for this. So I'll just go to channel five because then we can save one for flaps later if we decide to use it. So signal goes up, signal, then power, then ground. Okay, and negative is what ground is. Okay. So ground is a reference point in household electronics and ground is a reference point in a DC circuit on a radio controlled airplane too, okay? So we just need a reference so that we can know 
what voltage we're at. Okay, so the elevator is gonna be on port three. So orange is going up. That's where signal is. And what type of signal is it, camera crew? What type of signal? Yeah, this is rudder. That's not the question I was expecting you to ask me. It's pulse width modulation. Oh, dang it. I shouldn't have known that. So pulse width modulation um, modulates a pulse and it changes the length of the wave. So mm -hmm. up and down and up and down, 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 really, 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 really quick, close, really slow, really long. So it wa the wave would be expressed in some sort of an absolute value, but we express them on a spectrum radio system as plus or minus 100%, and then 50% additionally beyond on either side. So it can be plus or minus 150%. Okay, then there's throttle. So throttle needs to go into the first port. Now you'll notice that as I do this, I kind of like untangle the wires to a certain extent. They're never gonna be totally untangled, so don't stress out too much over that um, because there's just only so much you can do. Now, why do we plug throttle into a reflex, which is a stabilizer? Good question. The reason we do that is because throttle is going to be like the dedicated channel that we use to pull power over here. And you're like, yeah, but there's power on each and every one of these. And that is true. That's a good point. Okay. But sometimes that's the only place that we're getting power from BEC. I also think that they have some controls that are built in there for safety features, but I'm not aware of that. So I'm not going to speak to that since I don't know. Okay. Now that's one other thing we do here on Brian Phillips RC. We know a lot but we know our limits and we try to respect them as much as we can. When we don't know something, we try not to say it. And yes, I know that some of you will challenge me based on that because you're gonna be like, well, what about this one time you made a mistake? Yeah, I make mistakes, I'm human. Okay, so you see this? See how nice that looks? I'm gonna now move my radio out of the way and I'm gonna attempt to get this wiring in a spot where it kind of makes sense so it's out of the way. And I'm gonna do it in such a way that I don't have to use a bunch of additional tools or equipment if I can. Now, there's nothing miraculous about what I'm doing. There's nothing that's like especially great about it. It's just what I'm doing and it's what seems to be the right thing for me on this application. It's not like you can't do it another way. You can do it a million different ways. And I'm not trying to tell you on this particular step, this is just purely a preference and convenience thing. Okay, I'm finding a spot where it fits and then I'm gonna make sure that we clear this servo linkage, which I don't think we will, but it'd be really nice if we did. Because if we do, that would be really nice. Because look how nice and tight and concise, mm -hmm. and then that's gonna leave us some room for a battery. You need to look at this two camera crew if you wanna come around. Now, the other thing is there's pockets up here, which might be a safer place to stick it, but then that's gonna limit where we can put our battery. I think our battery is probably gonna go right here. So you know what, I actually, I'm gonna retract my original plan and I'm gonna pull that out. We're gonna go up front because I, I'm almost certain that linkage is gonna hit. So you see, I just, I just used the wire to wrap around the wire and I've got a couple of twists and stuff in there. And then I'm gonna stick this up here and see if it fits. Oh, come on, you can do it. Ooh, that's pretty good. That will work, I think. Now, we've got all our wire over here. Let's see if our canopy will go on. I have to kind of put the power cord in. Just get it out of the way. Ooh, see? Look at that. Is that gonna work? Even though that's held with the magnet, is that gonna work? No. We gotta have the wires so that they're not applying pressure to the top, okay? So that is not gonna work. So I'm gonna actually rearrange the wires so the wires go down first and then the transmitter comes up. Now, not to confuse you, but what's gonna happen is when you get into a stabilized receiver, you will be spatially aware in the stabilized receiver. So you do have a little bit more thinking to do when you install a stabilized receiver, because then you have to mount it in kind of a pseudo permanent fashion. And it has to be aware of its position with regard to the reality around it. So you have to know where up is, you have to know where the nose is, you have to know where the tail is. And you teach it. And I show you how to do that here on Brian Phillips RC. It's very easy, just part of the process. It's not anything fantastic. And yes, there are manuals you can follow, but who wants to read a manual these days? I sure as heck don't. Okay, 
So now that's all in there. That, that works pretty good. I think that's mm -hmm. going to be okay. I don't feel like it's going to jump around too bad on us. And I can get to the bind plug, but it's not being depressed all the time. So that's good. We also can see that the canopy goes on and we have a nice, good positive seat. It's all the way down and that won't pop off. That looks pretty sweet. All right, so now the next step is, of course, we need to get a battery that's gonna energize this so we can bind it. Now binding, of course, as we talked about, was the process where we teach the radio and the receiver uh, and the radio and the transmitter what the address is that it's gonna be talking to because it's after all, it's really just an address, okay? It's a unique address that's very long and there's a lot of them within the DSMX platform. Um, I believe they can handle like something like a thousand connections or something. I mean, don't mark my words on that. I am guessing on that. It's been a long time since I read about it. Um, okay, so 2S is just like I said, it's sort of an unusual size. We do have a 1300 milliamp, uh, we do have a 1300 milliamp 2S somewhere around here. Looks like, nope, those are both 3S's. Like I said, we just haven't done a lot of 2S planes lately. This one is 2S and it is 1300, it's a Venom. So it has an XT60 and you're probably thinking to yourself, well, goodness gracious, Brian, how are you gonna plug in an XT60 to a JST connector? Well, you have to have adapters for this sort of thing or you can cut off the end and very carefully build um, a JST end onto here. So I have tons of adapters of all sorts of si sizes and shapes. I'm just gonna go into my bag of goodies. This is just one of them. I have probably another four or five bags like this if you were to put them in bags. Okay, so there's some JST plugs. I don't even know for sure if I've got one that's like X. Uh, ooh, there's one. Nope, nope, nope. So here's, here's, Here's what we want. We want the JST, but obviously that's, that's not the right end. So what I need to do is I need to find one and then we'll come right back. All right, so I have a ton of adapters. As you can see, this is just a few of them. And we have tons more in here and there's just a million different ways that we can go from whatever to um, JST, okay? But the key is this. When you're going from a charger to a device, or to a battery, then, you know, we've got all sorts of different adapters like this, okay? So that would take us to Dean's end. You can buy them like that, or you can cut off the end and actually build an, an adapter that will go straight to JST. But you have to keep in mind there's a certain amount of current handling um, that each of these adapters, like this is an adapter I built some time ago that went from uh, XT60 to a Dean's, okay? So in this case, um, you know, you have to have the right end of that type. So like this is the correct end that I need if I was going from that Dean's, <laughs> but we've gotten right back from where we started. So at the end of the day, you know, I have lots of these cables and I can just build one, but I need it to be the right polarity so that it can go into that, okay? So I need like a male end. This, has, this is actually a male end, to be honest. I need a female end. The female speaks to, the female or male speaks to the actual piece of metal, um, not the other way around. So for instance, this is, this is a male end as well, okay? And then this would be a female end. And you're like, but that doohickey goes into the other doohickey. Yes, I, I understand the confusion. But inside of the doohickey, there's actually the doohickey, female style. Right. Right? And so this, this obviously won't work because it's the wrong style. So I will actually have to build an adapter to make this work, and it's not a big deal. It's just kind of one of those things you run into once in a while because I have millions of adapters, but I just happen to have all the wrong ones. So I'll show you what I come up with. Okay, so... In addition to making an adapter that goes from an XT60 like that to a JST, I have to be able to charge this battery. And my charger has uh, IC3s is the type of receptacle. So I'm gonna have to use an adapter just to plug it in and charge it. Now, ironically, this particular Venom battery does come with these adapters. So I've also built one like this years ago as well. So in this case, I'm gonna plug it into this charger 
Now, why don't we just show this because this would be a more appropriate charger. This is a really good charger if you wanna buy something that's gonna last a long time. It's two 200 watt chargers that come with both IC3 and IC5. IC5, of course, would be for some of these big batteries. And then IC3 would be for the smaller batteries. And similar to this, just happens to be that this one has the XT60 on it. Okay, so I'm gonna plug this in. And then this is gonna get plugged into the balance lead. Okay, so at 4.07, so I'm gonna press and hold. So this is the S155, so it gives you 55 watts on one channel. Okay, so I'm gonna scroll up here. And since it's not a smart battery, I have to set up the setting. So this is a 1300 milliamp, so 1.3 amps. Milli means thousand. Okay, so it's at 87% charge and it's gonna charge. Now, in addition to finding those adapters, that's one thing you always wanna kind of be privy to when you're getting a new plane is that you're gonna to need to energize it somehow. And so when you buy adapters, sometimes you're buying adapters to charge batteries or you're building adapters to charge batteries and sometimes you're getting adapters to fly batteries or to fly with batteries. And so just be mindful that you usually need both every time you get a plane that has a mismatch uh, because you're gonna have to charge that battery and you're gonna have to use the battery. And they're not always the same adapter. You would think it's the same adapter, but it's not. Sometimes it's the opposite end because what's going on is we're taking a small battery and we're adapting it to a big charger and then we're taking a relatively big battery and adapting it to a small plane, if that makes any sense, okay? So you have to pay attention to what direction you're going and the polarity of the plug, or not the polarity, but the gender of the plug. So I'll build an adapter and uh, we'll be right back. So stay tuned. All right guys, so I made this little adapter and I just used XT60 end and I used a little bit of heat shrink and then I used a finished with silicone JST connector. And as you can see, the battery is done. It says 100% charge. If I press down, each of the cells is at or about 4.2 volts. That's fully charged. And the balance charger, like this, uses all three of these wires to charge this cell and this cell and make sure that they stay. It charges through the main discharge, pushes the voltage in here, and then it maintains and balances here, okay? Now a smart battery would be a battery like this. This happens to be a three cell instead of a two cell, and it will actually automatically balance itself in here. And then there's also a smart lead. This happens to be an IC2, so as you can see, it's a little bit smaller, but it's got that little data pin in the middle. Okay, so continuing on, we're gonna go ahead and plug this into the plane. So we have our little adapter here and always double check your polarity. Now you could also cut the end off of this and make a JST end on. It'd be very challenging because that's big. The better thing to do would be to cut this end off and put an, X, uh, an Hextronics uh, XT60 on there or whatever your choice is, okay? So it is unusual to go from a big battery to a small connector. Now the reason it's unusual is because generally this connector can handle a lot more current than this connector, okay? So what may end up happening is if we have any issues where this wire is getting hot, we'll have to cut this off and actually put an XT60 or an EC3 or something that would be considerably similar. So in this case, we now have an adapter so we can use it as stock as possible. Now remember, where we left off, we were just getting ready to bind the airplane. So I turned off my radio because I had to go downstairs and do some soldering real quick. And now we've got our transmitter on. I'm gonna click and scroll down to this place where it says bind. Now the alternative measure is you can turn this off and you can press and hold your bind button, which is here, while powering it in no force bind mode, okay? But in our case, we're gonna go ahead and very carefully now, you're gonna treat this as though that prop is gonna start spinning because it could, but it usually doesn't happen. Okay, so I'm gonna push the battery in. They suggest putting it there, but I don't know if that's where it's gonna end up. And I'm gonna get my body in a way, if you can hang on to that vertical stabilizer, cam crew's gonna hold it just so it doesn't shoot toward me. And I'm just gonna plug it in. It shouldn't start, but if it does, I wanna be prepared. Okay, so we plug it in. It's flashing fast. I'm gonna press this button. Now it's flashing on the receiver. And I'm gonna click bind, bind. 
Okay, so now that's solid. Everything's energizing. I've got control of it now. We're gonna, first thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna turn the plane away from me and test the throttle. Throttle cut is on and we're safe there. Now I'm gonna turn off throttle cut. It could start when you shut off throttle cut. Throttle cuts off. Okay, cool. Pretty good amount of power for 2S. Okay, throttle mm -hmm. cuts on and tested. So now I can depend on being able to work with this with the battery energizing the circuit and not have to have fear that I'm gonna get cut. Now, how do we test that everything is working now that we've set everything up? That's our next part. This battery, let's see if it fits. There's a little bit of a pocket cut out in here. So let's see if that goes in. Okay, it, it does and it fits very good. So now I just wanna see if it slips out. Feels like it might. Yeah, see the battery? The battery slipped back. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a trick. And this is a trick you can do with shelf liner. And shelf liner is what you put into your shelves and it stops stuff from sticking or it, st it stops it from slipping. Mm -hmm. So like right here, got shown in here, right? Yep, under the, so your spoon. These spoons yep. don't move as much when they sit on that liner, okay? So this is just a drying mat. So the same thing can be done with the shelf liner here. And it's not gonna be attached, it's just literally gonna add friction. Oh. Yeah, it doesn't need to be a lot on this plane. Right. Okay, so I'm just gonna cut this little square off. And that might actually be a little bit too much. But this is on, the throttle cut's been tested. So on this application, I'm gonna actually just wrap it around the plane, around the battery, and just slip it in and see if that works. That probably will give us enough purchase Okay, now all I'm concerning myself right now is the battery. I'm trying to make the battery slip. Yes, it is slipping still. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna probably double this up by going like that. And this is just one method I've used in the past and it usually works okay because there's not really any retention strap. Okay, now I'm touching. Now let's see if we get enough. Put that down. I'm, I'm running into something now. I don't know what I'm running into though. I feel like I'm running into something. Is it? Oh, I'm actually running into that and that's okay. Because now listen and look. And I'll explain the noises. See, it didn't move. Okay. So now we can rest assured that that'll actually hold. Now we need to test control surface direction and we need to check for stabilization direction, okay? So elevator up, elevator down. It's actually not hooked up yet either. Rudder left, rudder right, roll left, roll right. So we're rolling the wrong way. When I push the stick this way, that should go the other way. They are attached to the same channel, so let's click, scroll down to servo setup, travel, and then go over to reverse and ailerons. Now look at, when I roll this way, the plane would roll. When I roll that way, the plane would roll. Now when I pull back on the stick, we're not actually hooked up, so only one half of it moves. Y'all left, y'all right. Y'all left, y'all right. Okay, so that's all good. I'm also looking at where everything is hitting to make sure that I'm not gonna have anything cut cables or bind or anything like that. So far, that's all good. Now we just need to get the elevator to be hooked up because the elevator was never actually you know, physically attached. But there's one more thing we have to test before we can actually set that up. And that is we need to know if we're in auto leveling mode or not. Why does that matter, camera crew? Because if you're in auto leveling mode, it's going to be adjusting your- Control surfaces. Control surfaces. So if you hook up the elevator- And, and it's in, upside down. Yeah, then you're, it's not in its home position. So you wanna be either an off or just in- It might be pointing the elevator up. Yeah. So we want it to be level. So how do we test the easiest way? Flip it on its belly or on its back. See the ailerons? They're trying to find level, the quickest route. So the quickest route at this point is down. The quickest route at this point is up on this wing, okay? So then when you get level, okay. So really all we need to do is just figure out how to shut that off. Now, remember how we plugged it into channel five? Channel mm -hmm. five is the gear switch. So now that should be off. And you can tell because when we get that halfway point, it doesn't go up and down. Now they're still moving, but that's stabilization and we'll be able to work with that, okay? 
So now I'm gonna lay this plane down here on the couch. I've got kind of a spot where I can squish it between my uh, mattress cushions there. And we can see that we have these two control horns and we need to basically be able to move this up and down. Okay, so I'm gonna take this and pop that open. You see how that opens up? And I wanna to go to the outside, the outside point because that's what they said for all the control surfaces, okay? Now, if you want more control, then you can go to the inside and you'll be, more, you'll be deflecting more. But we're gonna try it the way they prescribed in the manual first. So the first thing you do is you line that up kind of with where it's gonna be. And that looks pretty dang close actually. So we'll just pop that in. Sometimes you have to slide this little fuel tube back a little bit. And then you can go in there like that. You see how it's lined up right at the wing root. You can see that there's no gap up or down, okay? It's very hard to see, but you see right here? See how it's even top and bottom? That's what you're looking for. Then I'm gonna snap this. It snapped and then I'll pull the fuel tube back to kind of retain it. Okay, now let's do the same on the other side. So you want this to be level and that one needs to come out. So I'm gonna hang onto this with three fingers and then I'm gonna unscrew the control horn. I have to hold really, oh, nope, I need something stronger. I need to have needle nose pliers for this step because it's wanting to slip on me. And if you unscrew this, you're unscrewing it inside. So you have to brace it. Then I'm gonna untwist this and see how now it's untwisting easy. Okay, and you just wanna get that to where it's lined up with where that hole is in the neutral position. That looks pretty good there. Can they see what I'm doing? Mm-hmm, I'm just trying to stay out of your light. Well, I know, but I think mm -hmm. you're gonna have a hard time seeing what I'm actually doing. See this? So that way, see how that pin shoots out at us? I'm actually gonna pull this little sleeve back, this little fuel tube back so you can see what I'm talking about. This thing opens up and there's a pin in there. That pin needs to be aligned perfectly with the center of the hole. And I'm actually half a turn too far out. So I'm gonna go half a turn more and then I'm just aligning it. Yep, that's pretty dang close. And remember, that's a finite adjustment, okay? You're not gonna get it perfect. You're always gonna be half, half turn increments. If you need a quarter, then you'll have to do it with trim, okay? So now you look right here, right here. Is it lined up? Perfectly in alignment here, okay? You want no gap up or down, okay? All right, so now we can lay the plane down and we can test for elevator position. Elevator up, elevator down. Yaw left, yaw right, roll left, roll right. Okay, very, very good. Also, I'm noticing that that canopy is not always staying down, so we'll have to keep a close eye on that and see if it becomes a bit of an issue for us. Now, if a canopy opens, what's the worst that would happen, camera crew? Flies off while you're flying. And then what? your battery falls out. Yes. That's why we care. If it weren't for the battery potentially popping out, it probably wouldn't be a huge issue. We've flown planes without front ends before, intentionally. Okay, so all the surfaces are working the right direction. That's really cool. Then I also want this to be in the other position. I want that to be stabilization, auto leveling, because I don't ordinarily fly in auto leveling and that's my neutral condition. That's like how I start. So to do that, I'm gonna go to servo setup, go to travel, Click over to reverse there. And I'm gonna go to gear and I'm just gonna click that. So now I'm in stabilization only with the stick back on A. So it's not auto leveling. Now it is, okay? Now it's off. So now that we have everything else done, we know that all the surfaces are going the right direction. There's one last very important test. I'm just making sure this is not repelling. Sometimes if the magnets get mounted backward, they'll repel. I don't think it's repelling. A good way to test, if it's upside down, it will repel instead of biting, okay? If it's right side up, then it pulls. Okay, so I think it's correct. So I've got the battery all the way forward and I've got this down. They suggest all the way forward, but it depends on the weight of the battery. Okay, so the next thing I need to do now is test the stabilizer. I need to make sure that this goes up when I pull it up. Come here. 
See right here or right, this, this is part of the aileron, so you can't look there. You have to look right here. Up, down. It's gonna be extremely hard for them to see. Up, down. What you're looking for is right here, you're watching that go up and down, okay? So I'm gonna try to give you guys a shot of that. Okay, so when I do that, I'm gonna give you guys an ultra close up look. Okay, now I'm gonna move the plane toward me, I'm gonna move it away from me. I'm gonna move it toward me, I'm gonna move it away from me. You guys see what I'm doing there? It's very hard to see, but it's doing it. It's going away from me. It's going toward me, it's going away from me. It's going toward me, it's going away from me. So that's now been demonstrated and they can see. So now the elevator, I'm gonna do the exact same thing. You just have to look really close, up, down. So I'm gonna show you guys. You want the control surface to move the direction that you're moving it, okay? Up, this goes up and down, it goes down. Up, it goes up, down, it goes down. You guys can see that, surely. Now, same thing here. I'm gonna move the rudder and I'm gonna move it. I'm gonna try to rotate the plane and try to give you guys a square shot. Okay, so when I rotate the plane, uh, get the focus to go. I'm gonna rotate the plane this way, I'm gonna rotate the plane that way. I don't think we're gonna be able to show that. That's just too subtle. And the rudder doesn't have a whole lot of there movement. There and there. Anyway. I can definitely see it when I look close, but I have to swing it super fast. Now, that doesn't mean it's not working, but that also doesn't mean that it is working great. The amplitude of movement does not necessarily constitute a better or worse response. If it moves too far and it moves too easily, then that means your plane will start what's called a self-induced oscillation. So as you're flying along and you'll get to a higher speed, there'll be a little bit of a correction to go up and a little bit of correction to go down. And you'll get into this oscillation like this and it'll get increasingly worse if you don't do something to stop it. And what I mean by do something to stop it is you slow down a little bit and then it'll come out of it right away. Same thing can start here. It'll start wiggling left and right or it'll roll like this. That's a self-induced oscillation or it'll oscillate on the yaw axis. So there's pitch, roll, there's pitch, roll, and yaw. And all three of those axes are controlled actively um, by the stabilizer. And then when you go into auto leveling, there's just more control. And then they also limit, so you can't flip it upside down as easy, okay? Now, all those things considered, we now have all the controls working. We definitely can taxi around, which is totally cool. It's pretty quiet, which is what we like on a small plane like this. It's gonna be a blast to fly. And with the stabilizer installed in there, it should be easier to fly than what it would be ordinarily without that stabilizer. I'm concerned about a few things. One, this thing doesn't wanna stay down and I don't like that because you do want that to be able to be all the way on and seated, okay? Because you don't want that to come off in flight. I think it's got a little bit to do with our shelf liner, but our shelf liner is kind of a must have right now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull this battery back out and I'm gonna re-manipulate my shelf liner so that only a little bit is on the top and a lot more is on the back. See that? Then when I slide this into the opening, that will get out of the way of the little finger that goes mm, up in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so see if that helps. That's way That's better. You better. heard the positive seat this time. Okay, so we're pretty much done on all the setup. We have Expo set up, we have dual rates set up. Uh, dual rates in Expo, that's one setting in this transmitter. We have throttle cut set up, so it's safe, so it won't go. I'm gonna shut off throttle cut. See, now it's going, throttle cut's on. Okay, so we're good there. We have roll left, roll right, elevator up, elevator down, yaw left, yaw right. I'm moving the controller to help my brain connect the dots. If you get the roll axis wrong, you will crash your plane. 100%. Roll left, roll right. Up, down. Yaw left, yaw right. Don't forget to check your steerable nose gear. Left, right. Yep, so we're good there. Everything looks perfect. Now, the last and final test we need to test is for CG, center of gravity. They suggest 45 millimeters from the leading edge of the wing. That's in the manual right there, okay? 45 millimeters is easily measured with a pair of calipers. This is a pretty fancy one. You don't have to use fancy ones. You can use the cheap crappy ones if you want. These are still cheap. It's like a $20 tool and you can use them for other things as well. Now they show from the, the front edge of the wing. So I'm just gonna go from here. I'm just gonna go back like that and then make a little bump. Yep, that looks good. I'm gonna do the same thing here. Just make sure we have it about the same distance out. And then yes, I'm going to actually just 
deface my airplane by making a bump. Now, why do I want a bump there? That looks really front, like really, really far out there. Yeah, it does. Like, I don't necessarily think I trust that, but we're gonna run with it for now, okay? The reason I'm gonna run with it is because FMS historically has done a very good job of updating instructions. If there's problems when they go from V1 to V2, this is an original instruction. Looks like it's been updated a little bit, but maybe not entirely. So it's possible that could be a little bit wrong. I know that on some of the T28s, it does seem to ride a little bit forward, but this is like, if this was six parts, it would be like one sixth back. Normally it'd be like two thirds of the way back, okay? Or excuse me, not two thirds, it'd be like one third of the way back. So it, it seems a little bit further back than it should be. Um, so how do you test the CG? You get your battery where you want it, then you balance it on that spot, okay? And if it's balanced, the nose should be just slightly down. I'm gonna balance back here because it's kind of hard to hold it on the leading edge of the wing and it's tail heavy as a result of that very, very far forward. But I tend to think that that's probably more like it. You see where my middle fingers are? It's just about five to six degree or five to six millimeters behind the center of gravity they recommend. I'm sure this thing is gonna fly rock solid. Now, I could be wrong, but how do you make it more nose heavy if you want it to balance on that CG? Move you would have to get forward. more weight forward, yeah. a larger battery because it sits in front of that mark, or you can remove weight from the back if you had weight to remove. Okay, so there's three ways you can do it. You can put more weight up front, or you can take less weight and add it as far forward as possible. So the heavier and more dense it is, which is why people use lead weights, they'll put them all the way up forward as far as you can find. Find a spot to put it under the cowl or whatever. My experience is I don't like dead weight. It does nothing to help fly the plane other than get the balance right. So use a bigger battery if you can, but just bearing in mind that battery might be this long instead of this long. So that means that you need more added weight. All up weight does matter, but center of gravity weight is strangely less critical because if your center of gravity is not right, you can fly a heavier plane most of the time, but you can't necessarily fly a plane that's tail heavy, especially as a beginner. Stabilizer is gonna help if you tend to be a little bit more tail heavy than you would be um, really struggling to fly a plane that's tail heavy uh, without a stabilizer. And I just, I say that from experience, um, but generally speaking, the rule of thumb is tail heavy planes fly once because you crash and then nose heavy planes um, uh, fly poorly. Now, nose heavy means that the plane is extra stable, which means your elevator is weak. You will be pulling all the elevator you've got, and that's another reason why I do expo instead of rates. Because if I drop my rates down to make it more controllable, when I was in a tail heavy configuration and I overshot really badly and went to a nose heavy configuration, you may not have enough control to pull out of a dive and you might crash. But generally speaking, you just can't fly it as good as you want to. It'll fly super stable, it'll fly super good when it's nose heavy. It's gonna fly super crazy when it's tail heavy. But there are times as you experience in advance to the ranks in flying that you might want your plane to be slightly tail heavy. Like when you have a jet that flies 110 miles an hour and you need to be able to bring it in and land it like this so you can slow it down, okay? This plane, we're gonna have a very light flare on it, but you're not gonna be bringing it in, flying it like this to land, you know? Whereas that F-16, you would actually bring it in on a very high um, flare if you can, almost in an alpha configuration, an alpha configuration where you're high alpha configuration. Okay, cool. So that's everything on this plane. It looks really nice. It's simple. It's a kind of a basic looking, it looks nice. And there's something to be said for planes that do what they do well. And there's something to be said for planes that look really good doing what they do well. And I think that this looks really good and I'm sure it's gonna do what it does well. Now, a couple of drawbacks I'm gonna point out right now. Notably, no flaps. Flaps are not necessary for flight performance for people flying small planes in most cases. However, I like to widen the flight envelope so I can go slower 
and faster without giving up the slower, okay? Faster planes, okay, now there is a certain argument to be made that a heavier plane that has flaps will have to necessarily fly faster to, to keep from stalling. But if you change the shape of the wing with an inboard flap right here, then you can actually slow the plane down on a heavier plane and still not stall. So I love that that gives you more exposure to a more, you know, more skills. You don't have to use flaps just because they're there, but generally if you have flaps, you're gonna be more inclined to need them because you have a heavier all out plane, okay? So that's one of the reasons why they do that. Secondarily, of course, it's more expensive that way. So if they're trying to hit a certain price point, they're gonna take out features until they get to the price point they need uh, so that they can bring them to market and actually sell them because if they make them and they don't sell them, they just, you know, they're just garbage then. So that being said, flaps, I note that they're not, they're not there. LEDs, I note that they're not there. That is something I would like to see on this plane, but it is a small plane, so it kind of makes sense that the flaps and LEDs are not there. However, I still like them both. Now, on this size class, retracts are really not a super must have, but I must say, retracts on any size plane are sweet. However, on this size class, that would add a lot of weight for what you get because the amount of drag uh, to weight coefficient would not necessarily put it in a good spot. Also, it's quite easy to remove these gear. You can remove the mains in seconds. You can remove this with another five seconds because you got one, one and a half millimeter set screw and you've got your landing gear off. And you can just belly land this. And you're like, but Brian, won't I break my prop when I land? Probably not. I mean, it's kind of amazing. When you fly these planes, you will think as, an, as a new pilot, you're gonna think, I'm gonna break my prop. I'm gonna, I'm gonna break my prop if I belly land. You, you probably won't break your prop, okay? You'll just bring it in, you can stall in a tall grass if you're nervous, but generally speaking, three-bladed props are a little bit harder to get out of the way than a two-bladed prop where it can, you know, go flat. But nine times out of 10, you're gonna hit the prop anyway and it just pops out of the way. And it's weird, you won't believe me until you do it about 100 times. Now. You can break your prop landing, a belly landing. I mean, it happens all the time when they're landing emergency landings on real planes, but these things are not real planes, okay? They're real planes, only small, but they're not like a real plane in terms of the density of material compared to the weight of the aircraft and all that sort of stuff. So yes, this thing absolutely looks fantastic. I hope that the things we touched on in this video will help to take you from where you are to where you wanna be. And hopefully I'm not preaching in the choir to a bunch of super experienced pilots that are like, goodness gracious, Brian, you're going way into, way into the weeds. But just remember guys, you were a new pilot at one point, if you're one of those pilots, and I'm one of those pilots right now, where everything I've said, I have a pretty good grip on, or I wouldn't try to be teaching other people about it. And uh, the stuff I don't know, I'm still learning. And that's the cool part about Brian Phillips RC, which is what you're watching now. And it's cool that you're here with us because we literally have thousands of videos just like this. So if you even remotely enjoy this video, we want you to stay tuned, click the bell for notifications. Obviously subscribe if you haven't subscribed, it doesn't cost you anything, you might as well do it. And if you click the bell for notifications, you're gonna get notified. We usually release something at the beginning of the week. We got a little midweek break where we do some ground vehicles, surface vehicles. We'd like to do some boats and things like that if we can ever get a pond, put it in our property and then obviously floats as well. And then of course we have our new big release Thursday or Friday of the week. And then we try to do kind of the off the wall stuff on Sundays. That's what we've been, we be getting into this format and we hope that you guys are enjoying the format. And then we've been doing unbox, uh, build and radio setup for years, but we usually just, we used to sandwich our maiden flight right at the beginning. It's just one video. Well, people said we want to see them separate so that they can scroll in the status bar and find bits and pieces easier because it is kind of hard to find exact steps on that status bar on YouTube. Hey, tip for that. If you are going to need the status bar so you can find something I'm saying, you want to rewind a couple of seconds, you can change the playback speed and uh, all you have to do is click the gear. Right? This gear is usually down there for you guys. And then you'll open it up and you've got the playback speed, even on mobile devices, it really helps. So if you're new and you're like, I can't keep up with a radio setup, slow it down when I'm talking about the radio setup part. Uh, it will help immensely. And then if I'm way too long winded, just put it to like two times, you won't lose the audio. So you can still hear what I'm saying, but it'll go much faster. And then there are gonna be times when I go off in the weeds and talk about something that you just really understand and you wanna just skip past it. 
The other thing is too, is repetition is a great way to learn. So if you are really a new pilot and maybe you're a year into it and you're just kind of developing your skills and this is gonna be like your third plane or your second plane, um, this would be a good video for you. And also, if you're two planes deep and you're flying this plane, you're doing good. So just remember, don't give up. There's a lot of struggle when you're new. It's hard, it's a hard skill. You cannot buy the skill of flying radio controlled airplanes. It is something that takes years to get good at. And I think I'm good at it. I'm not an expert by any means. And there's a lot of people that are way better than me, but I am a lot better now than I was eight or so years ago when I started flying, which is documented on YouTube. If you want to watch how bad of a pilot I was, just go back and watch some of those videos. So, I mean, I, everybody gets lucky too. So there's some flights back there that look really good. Uh, but I can do it more consistently, more reliably. I have a better understanding of my limitations and I am improving all the time, just like you are. So the cool thing is, if you get into the hobby now, then you're gonna be better in six months. Even if you're still sucky in six months, you're gonna be less sucky than you were six months ago. And this is true for any pilot. So get out there, start today. Don't wait six months. You don't know if you're gonna get plowed by a beer truck tomorrow. You could be dead tomorrow. So start today and that's an important reality that we all face uh, because we're not guaranteed tomorrow so if you love this hobby and you want to get into it then definitely we're here to help and uh, obviously there's going to be some great flight clubs uh, flying clubs that you can get involved with if you want uh, but for now we just hope you guys will come back for more we have tons of new footage coming we're trying to put out so much content just to kind of like overwhelm you with good choices and if you don't like the plane that, that we're doing today, just wait a few, few days and we're gonna have more coming. But if you think we've already maybe done it, you can go in and search at YouTube. And when you search at YouTube, if you still can't find it, but you think maybe we've done something or I've mentioned it, leave it in the comments as a question and I'll try my best to answer. We do have thousands of questions that we answer a week. So sometimes we get a little behind. We are currently behind. So please forgive us. We try to reply to 100% of comments. Um, the first comment, not the replies to replies because we don't see those as easily. Um, so if it's something important, ask it as a virgin question. Don't reply to somebody else's remark. And then timestamp your questions. It helps me to understand the context of what you're asking because even though it seems like you would be able to remember that, Brian, I have done thousands of these videos, thousands. I'm not exaggerating. I'm literal when I say that. So it is hard for me to remember the difference between this and that. If it's fresh, sometimes I remember, but if it's like six, eight months old, I mean, I've moved on and done other things since then. So keep that in mind and timestamp your video. That means type zero, zero, colon, zero, five. That would start the video at five seconds and I could see what you were referencing. Or if it's one hour, 32 minutes, one colon, 32, colon, zero, zero. That would start at 32 minutes into the uh, second hour of the video, okay? and I would be able to see exactly what you're seeing and the context therein so I can answer your question better. Also, if you guys aren't already part of this RC community, just remember there's lots of people in the RC community. Some are great, some are terrible, some are helpful, some are not. We hope that we're the former in that regard and we are definitely gonna try our very best to help you guys through the humps in the road because when you're first starting, it's very easy to get discouraged because it is hard. Another way that you can get better is fly a lot. And if you get better and you fly the right type of planes, we're gonna hear, we're gonna hear, we're gonna tell you the news you don't want, that's not for you if you're a new pilot. That D18, that's not for you as a new pilot. It, and maybe a new pilot. The Technum, that would be for you as a new pilot. That Bayhawk, that's not for you as a new pilot. That uh, SU-27, that's not for you as a new pilot. But you know, like this Boeing 737 MAX 9, that's not for you as a new pilot. That Futura, not for you as a new pilot. But you know what? We literally have hundreds of other great choices that would work perfect for you as a new pilot. And we have a list of beginner planes if you're curious. This would not be a bad choice as a second or third plane. It probably not wouldn't be the best choice for a first plane because it's small. Small is great if you live on a boat. And yes, we did have some people that were sharing that. That was pretty cool. It's always neat to hear about people's different interesting lifestyles. Um, but if you don't live on a boat, then don't get this plane for your first plane. My guess is it's gonna fly faster and harder than the 1.2 meter configuration. And you're like, but the 1.2 is more expensive, Brian. 
Yeah, we understand that. But sometimes more expensive is easier to fly and it's a better fit for what you need. There's also cheaper planes that are bigger. Like we have a 1.8 meter uh, PA-18. It's called a Super Cub or Sport Cub. Super Cub. Super Cub. Super Cub. And that's made by FMS. Great plane. We just did it the other day. That would be a, a really good beginner plane. But there's also about 40 other good beginner planes. And we have a list that's just kind of the generic stuff with all the video links and all that. So just ask. I'll, I'll reply to you with a, a comment on that. But other than that, Camera Crew, do you have any thoughts on this before we continue? I'm excited to see this one because I think if it flies as good as it looks like it's going to, for mm -hmm. people that are concerned about space, if you live in an apartment or on a boat. Or you have a small have, car. Yep. And you have to transport There this. is a huge difference between an 800 millimeter and even a 1200. Oh, it's But gigantic. especially compared to a 15 or a 17, it's... It's not even hardly past my knee. Yeah. But you know what? It's this is going to be still size fun size. to fly. Yep. But it's it's still got strength to it. It's not yep. going to be like a UMX not, that's going to break mm -hmm. or because a the foam millimeter, is more sturdy. You know, something that's way small. That's This is a hobby grade. You're getting into the hobby. It's not just a toy. Yeah, this so. is definitely not toy grade. This mm -hmm. is hobby grade. Yep. But it also costs some money, and we understand that. Yep. And that's one of the biggest things you guys can do to help us is as you spend your like really hard-fought, RC budget. When you're first new, you're going to just feel like, oh man, I'm never going to be able to afford an NX8. I'm never going to be able to afford a, a dual channel charger, or I'm never going to be able to afford a 6S battery that yeah. costs 200 bucks. You know, these are the things that you have to overcome as you build up your repertoire of stuff, like this battery that I had lying around, right? Well, if you don't have that battery, you're going to have to buy one, right? Mm -hmm. Well, when you're first buying planes, you got to buy a battery every time you get a plane. And usually you're not just getting one. If you're like me, you're getting like five. Well, don't get five, get two quality batteries. And then, you know, spend the premium on the smart technology now because then they'll auto discharge and you'll get five, six years out of them instead of two years, you know, because you will destroy your batteries if you don't discharge them. And I didn't and I destroyed mine. Uh, but the smart batteries automatically discharge. So that's what we're here to help you. And you're like, what the heck is a smart battery and why do I care? And why is it so much more expensive? Because they last longer and they have more technology and they're safer. And like I said, number one safety issue is lipos, that thing, the battery in there. Number two safety issue is props. Not running into your own head, although I'm sure some idiot's done that and probably got hurt. But the thing is, it's such a new one. I mean, it's like never happens. You don't have to worry about it. Um, what you do have to worry about is props and you do have to worry about batteries. Those are the two things. Make sure you're charging on a hard surface when you're around, paying attention, okay? Don't charge it when you're smoking in bed alone. Okay, Don't also in the neighbor's that. house. Make sure, make sure you're smoking in your own bed with your charger next to you. Don't, actually, don't do that smoking in bed. I think that's bad, I hear. Um, but anyway, if you, if you don't have a garage to put it in, you know, an apartment complex or something like that, then make sure you do a hard surface. If you don't have a hard surface, like a counter like this, this is granite, get cookie sheets. Lay a couple cookie sheets together and that will help protect you if you have to charge it on like a carpet floor or something like that. Make sure it's away from flammables as much as possible. Lipo fires are fast and intense and then they're done. So if it doesn't catch anything else, unfortunately they're very fast. It's like when you light a match, big explosive chemical reaction and then done. Small battery like this, not gonna make a huge difference. You got a pile of batteries, might be a little bit more intense, like burn your house down intense. So anyway, um, on that high note. Yeah, on that high note. We really appreciate you guys being here. If you want to help support us financially, we have Patreon and PayPal down below. But really, we've said it a million times, the best way you can support us on Brian Phillips RC is buy the amazing planes that we review. Even if you hate this one, maybe this is a perfect fit for somebody else. And you, and you really want that F-16. Mm -hmm. Well, buy the F-16 okay. then. We have links in the video description below. Just scroll down a little bit more and you can see them. And we have them organized by manufacturer and all that good stuff. But really, what we do is when we review these planes, we get these planes, we get small commissions when you guys buy them. You don't pay any extra, but we make a small commission on your purchase from the manufacturer, distributor, hobby shop, mom pop shop, whatever it is that's sending it out for review. We could never afford to buy all this stuff because we get all the newest planes, which is an amazing opportunity. And we're humbled by the opportunity that we have in front of us. And we love doing it but it's also probably a little bit more work than you might realize. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes and it's basically a full-time job for two of us. So, and full-time plus. And we've invested 
hundreds of thousands of dollars to be doing it here too, which, you know, that's on the low end. So we love doing it and we are invested and we're gonna be in it for the long haul. So we hope that you guys will too. And as you advance through the ranks and you don't need us as much anymore, one of the things you can still do is buy from the links, which we really appreciate it. And that is probably the easiest thing to do. Mm -hmm. Watching the videos, obviously, you're watching the video now or you wouldn't be hearing me say these words, but that's the number one way. The second way is Patreon and PayPal. And yes, there are fees on both, but the fee structure on PayPal is slightly lower than the fee structure on Patreon. If you're concerned about these things, it annoys me when I have to pay fees. It annoys you guys when you have to pay fees, almost certainly. So I only say that for transparency reasons. For years, we bucked the whole idea of having Patreon. I used to call them Patreon begging sites. And I hate the fact that we have to say it out loud, but at the end of the day, if you guys want to support us, and there are so many of you guys have been the world's best audience. You guys are always throwing us a few bucks here and there, and it's much appreciated. But the biggest thing is, and I got to come back to this full circle, buy the planes that you like from the links. It costs you nothing extra to do it. And that is how we literally fund this channel. And it is by far and away, by factors of hundreds, that's where we make the money that comes in from this. And yes, I do have a day job. And yes, I make a lot more money on my day job than I do doing this. But I love this and I wanna make it my day job someday. And you guys can help be a very small part of that if you start buying your planes when we show them. And also, if we've convinced you that this is better than the competitive offering, let us know why and how you came to that conclusion. And then share your stories about how we've helped you get over a hump or you know, talked you past the ledge on maybe this or that item. We hear about it all the time and it's super encouraging for other people to hear that. Mm -hmm. So put it in the comments below. You don't have to, you know, like some private message or something like that. I mean, it's just, it's good for the rest of the people to understand that there is truth in what we're saying. We're not just blowing smoke here on Brian Phillips RC. This isn't the cheapest. This isn't the fastest. This isn't the best. That's not what the marketing companies want us to say. We tell you the way it is. If this thing sucks, we're going to tell you that. But it, I kind of doubt it's going to suck because it looks pretty sweet so far. So guys, that's all you got. I'm done preaching for tonight. So come back. I would say next Sunday, but there's going to be many, many videos between, between now and then. <laughs> <laughs> so come, come back midweek and then again, and we will look forward to seeing you there. Thanks for watching.